So hello, just wanted to do a quick little intro with a bit of info before we get into the actual tier list. This is a compilation video of a series I did where I beat and rated every modern FromSoft boss. The only real difference between this compilation and the individual videos is that I cleaned them up a bit and removed the outros. I also just like it when YouTubers I watch do this sort of thing, so I also just wanted to do it. The series took me quite a while to finish, starting in September 2022 and finishing in March of this year. Because of this, the quality of both the editing and the voiceovers will vary quite a bit, so don't feel bad if you need to skip the first couple of tiers. Both the music and voice volume may go up and down a bit, but I tried to normalize this as much as I could. But yeah, that was mainly what I wanted to say, so I hope you enjoyed the video. Bye! 6 games, 200 plus hours, and 20,000 words worth of notes later, I have made a FromSoft tier list which includes every single boss, from Dark Souls 1 to Elden Ring. The way I've set this up is I've separated the list into 8 tiers, those being Terrible, Bad, Lackluster, Okay, Good, Very Good, Great, and Amazing. This might sound a bit vague, but I'll explain each individual tier once we get to them. We're going to start from Terrible and work our way up from there. I included every single boss from all FromSoft games, excluding Demon Souls because it's the only game that I can't actually play right now, and only some of the Elden Ring bosses for obvious reasons. The Elden Ring bosses that I did choose were mainly the ones that give an achievement and a remembrance, but also some of my personal favorites. When it comes to the actual way I rated the bosses, I took into account their design, lore, music, arena, and also their actual fight, so their attacks and the general flow of the fight. This being said, I did rate each fight for how it works in their own respective game, so there might be a slight bias towards the newer games as they don't have as many flaws in their combat system as the older ones do, but this was the fairest way to do it that I could think of. Okay, with all that out of the way, let's get into the actual tier list. So starting off the list, we have the worst boss in Souls history, Bed of Chaos. Fighting this boss is probably one of the most frustrating things I've ever done in any game ever. There are simply no redeeming qualities about this boss at all. The entire fight is just you running across the arena to destroy two glowing branches to lower her shield, to where you just run down the middle and hit her real body once, killing her. When simplified like this, it doesn't really sound all that bad, but oh my lord did they make this simple task as frustrating as humanly possible. As you are running through the boss room, Bed of Chaos will do these swiping attacks, which admittedly are pretty easy to dodge, but the thing is, even if you are mid-roll, if the hands connect with your character, it will drag you with it, which 99% of the time will end of you being dragged into one of the 200 holes in her arena, which of course instantly kills you. The saving grace here being that it will save your progress, so once you have destroyed a branch, it will stay dead. While replaying Dark Souls 1 for this video, she took me 7 tries, and that is with knowing exactly what to do. I can't even imagine how miserable this fight must be for someone who's going in completely blind. So somehow the worst part of the fight isn't even the fight itself, it's the run back to the fight. Not only do you most likely have to do the run back several times from being dragged off the arena, but the actual run back will take you 1 minute and 40 seconds every single time. This also includes having to put on your lava ring every single time, as there's a small patch of lava they have to walk through every single time you run back from the boss. All of this culminates into the worst fight in all of Souls. I mean, at least it's kind of satisfying killing the little thing at the end. But man, fuck this fight. Okay, so next up we have Vlad and Zalin from Dark Souls 2. I'm going to be completely honest here, 90% of the reason it's this far down is purely because of its runback. This runback is infamously bad, and if you have ever done it, you will understand why they got this placement. To elaborate if you've never done it yourself, to get to this boss you have to first get in a coffin which then plays an unskippable cutscene where you slide off of the castle wall. From here you have to run in a straight line for roughly 2-3 to three minutes while being completely blinded by a snowstorm, and like this wasn't bad enough, you're also getting constantly rushed down by unicorn enemies that will come out of literally nowhere and try and stab you. When you finally get to the boss it doesn't really get all that much better. The actual boss is a duo fight which consists of two separate reskins of the same boss from earlier in the same DLC. This is awful in several ways. First off, it's extremely lazy of FromSoft for two of the three bosses to be the same boss but reskinned. Secondly, the boss that was reskinned, Ava, who we'll get back to later in this list, isn't even that bad of a boss. Without giving up too much of a ranking, when fought alone, Ava is actually a pretty enjoyable fight, but sadly the same can't be said for Lod and Zalin. Ava was very obviously made to be fought one on one, so when you put two of them together in the same boss fight, the results aren't all that great. They constantly overlap, stopping you from getting in attacks if you're lucky, and instantly killing you if you're unlucky. They will also sometimes overlap in such a way that there is no possible way of not taking damage. So the only viable way of fighting them is to rush one of them down, making it a one on one fight that isn't really all that hard. This will most likely end in you dying several times having to do that awful run back over and over again. 
So yeah, this boss doesn't really have all that much going for it, which is why they deserve their placement in the terrible tier. For our third entry into the terrible list, we have Ancient Wyvern. I'm going to be honest, I don't really have that much to say about this one. The fight itself isn't really much of a fight, and more of a sprint really. The entire fight is just running through a linear path filled with enemies until you get to the end, where you do a punching attack and kill the boss in one hit. During the run, the Wyvern will do several fire breathing attacks in your, like, your general direction, but I honestly wouldn't blame you if you didn't even know this, even after having done the fight yourself, as they don't really do anything most of the time. The enemies that are placed in this path aren't particularly hard to kill, but there isn't really any reason to kill them, as there isn't any punishment for just simply running past them. They do have some really annoying attacks you have to deal with as you run past, as they have a plethora of long range attacks they will spam at you. But the worst part is the big dude at the end, as there is a high chance that he will snipe you off the ladder as you climb it, which 99% of the time will end with you dying and having to do the run all over again. And even after all this, there's still a fairly big chance that the plunging attack will simply just bug and you fall to your death. So yeah, the entire fight is basically just a run back that you have to do just to do a single plunging attack. I was honestly wondering if I was going to place it on the list at all, but after having done it again while replaying all the games for this video, its placement is very deserved. Next we have the last boss of the terrible tier, and already the second Dark Souls 2 boss to make an appearance, the Executioner's Chariot. This entire fight is pretty much a gimmick fight. We have to run through a circular corridor as a chariot rides around in circles and one-shotting you if you don't get into one of the cubby holes in time. This obviously wasn't enough, so there's also a plethora of skeletons throughout the corridor, including inside the little cubby holes. These skeletons will infinitely respawn unless you kill a specific enemy who is hiding, but this isn't really viable as you should just try and sprint to the end. Problem is that if there is a skeleton inside one of the cubby holes, you better start praying, as there isn't really anything you can do about it. If you attack, then there's a high chance that the chariot will hit you, as the space you're in is extremely narrow. And of course, the skeleton can also hit you, which pushes you inside the path of the chariot. When you get to the end, there is a lever that lowers a gate that the chariot crashes into, which turns it into a one-on-one -on -one fight between you and the horse that pulled the chariot. This is a very boring fight, as the horse only has three attacks that it can use. But it has a saving grace that once you unmount the chariot, there is a very high chance that you'll just kill it on your first try. So like with the rest of the entries in this list, the worst part of this fight is the run back. The run back itself is fairly long, taking around a minute and 20 seconds to get to the fight game. This is a fairly substantial amount of time, and only making it worse is the abundance of enemies that are scattered throughout the run. The absolute worst part being the end, which is crowded by a fairly hard enemy that will kill you in only a few hits. This being made many times worse by the fact that in Dark Souls 2, the fog gate doesn't give you iframes, so you will most of the time get hit out of the animation and die. And trust me, this mechanic is very much going to be mentioned a few more times throughout the video. All of this added together makes for a pretty terrible fight, which is why it very much deserves a spot in the terrible tier. Okay, yeah, so I lied, but think of this as a bonus entry, and I swear this will be the only minor boss from Elden Ring that I include out of spite. As I was making this video, I was talking to a friend of mine about duo fights in this series, and he mentioned duo crucible knights, and I got so worked off from shitting on them to him that I decided fuck it. I'll add him to the list purely out of spite. But okay, in my defense, Duo of Crucible Knights highlights something that I think is a fairly important problem when it comes to a lot of duo fights in FromSoft games. FromSoft for some reason really likes to throw in two random enemies into a fight and calling it a duo fight. Obviously, I know that this isn't really fair to say for a random dungeon fight in Elden Ring. It's obviously there as padding as they couldn't make a unique fight for every dungeon in the game. That's just unreasonable. But even then I think it's a problematic fight. As I was fighting these two, I started wondering if FromSoft even playtests the duo fights they throw in together. Duo Crucible Knights aren't even fun to play against, they have negative synergy with each other. They're both very aggressive melee enemies that have an insane amount of poise. The point about poise probably being the worst offender of the fight. Giving them unlimited poise makes them near impossible to fight as a heavy sword user, where you depend on staggering enemies when it comes to fighting multiple ones. You are locked in animation for far too long, making it so unless you are waiting an ungodly amount of time in between each hit, waiting for the perfect chance to hit, you are pretty much guaranteed to get the hit back. 
There are examples of fights against multiple of the same enemy as a dungeon fight that actually works pretty well. Take for example the fight against the Crystallians. While at first glance they would suffer from the same problem as they also have infinite poise, they also have an added mechanic where you can break them, making it so they have no poise. This is a smart solution to the exact problem that Duo Crucible Knights have, making it a lot more rewarding to wait for an opening to get your hits in. This also makes it a lot more worthwhile to trade hits. I will give FromSoft some slack though. I'm sure they were very pressed for both time and resources as they were making Elden Ring. It's way bigger than any game they've ever made before, and still matters to have an impressive amount of diversity in dungeon design and fight. In order to have well-designed fights like the Crystallians, they probably had to make sacrifices like the Duo Crucible Knights. I just wish they hadn't made it a boss for a hero's tomb. Okay, so here's where we move from the terrible tier to the bad tier. Basically, the difference between these two is while both are filled with bad fights, terrible fights are actively annoying and unfun to do. Meanwhile, the bad fights are usually just fights that are for the most part boring, but are still somewhat annoying to do. Though with most of these fights being boring, I wouldn't really have that much to say about them, so most of the entries in this tier are going to be very short. With that out of the way, let's move on to the worst of the bad fights. To sum up the Skeleton Lords, it's basically just an ad fight. All you do is kill random mobs, with some variation, in that the fight slightly changes depending on what order you kill the skeleton lords in, but all the changes is what and how much trash you kill in what order. The reason why I place it where it is, is because I can't really say it's quite terrible as it's far too easy to be annoying, but you can barely even call it a boss fight. Don't really have much else to say about them, so let's just move on. Well, so you might start to know it's a bit of a pattern with the next few entries. Royal Rat Vanguard, much like the Skeleton Lords, is just a glorified ad battle. All you do is kill a bunch of rats until it finally decides to spawn in the big boss rat. The actual boss rat is barely any different from the other rats when it comes to appearance, and honestly the same when it comes to how hard it is to kill. Most people by the time they get to this boss can very easily one-shot the boss rat in one combo, making this fight a joke. Only reason I place it higher than Skeleton Lords is that there is actually a boss enemy this time. And I guess if you were to be very unlucky, you could get cornered and might even somehow manage to die. Finally, we get a break from Dark Souls 2's ads fight, though by going by its placement, the fight obviously isn't much better. As opposed to the Vanguard version, this time it's mostly against one enemy. Technically, the fight comes with some ads as well, but they're pretty easy to deal with at the start of the fight. How to deal with the ads, all this fight boils down to is a very oversized rat that has a total of 3 moves that really loves to either jump really far away so you have to constantly run around or stand right on top of you so you can't see anything at all. If you were to do this fight at a higher new game plus, I could honestly easily see this fight ending up in the terrible tier. But seeing how I haven't done that, it ends up here at the bottom of the bad tier. This is honestly a fight that most of you are probably expecting in the terrible tier and I do agree that this fight is terrible. But for the sake of this video and the criteria I gave earlier, can't really place it much lower. While the fight is terrible and is just killing ants, it's also an extremely easy fight. All you do is run around and kill a bunch of low HP enemies while using the debris around the room to block the magic being thrown at you. If the casters were stronger and actually had the possibility of killing you, I probably would rank it lower, but it's basically impossible to die in this fight, which is why I can't really rank it any lower. It's not a frustrating fight, but it sure is a bad one. Keeping to the trend of Dark Souls 2 ad fights, we have this gem from the first DLC. I don't really have much to say about this fight. All it is is just a fight against three NPC enemies who are for some reason dressed in clothing from past NPCs in the Soul series. There isn't really anything special to the fight. Another really easy ad fight where all you do is just spam R1 to stun like the enemy and kill them all in a combo or two. The main reason this ends up above any of the fights below is that you at least fight somewhat unique enemies, as the people you fight are in recognizable armor. But honestly, all of the fights so far in the bad tier are as bad as each other and the placements are somewhat arbitrary. Okay, to start off, I need to give Walner some props. The intro and the start of the fight are honestly pretty good. The cutscene where you get transported to Zarina and the actual reveal of Walner himself are both done pretty damn well. That is also where my praise of the fight ends. The actual fight is honestly straight up terrible. All you do is hug his arm and beat the shit out of him until his bracelets break. 
that's it. You barely need to actively try to dodge his attacks. All you really need to do is pay attention to when he decides to move up. Though my number one complaint with this fight is that despite the fight being extremely easy, it's also not that hard to die in it. See, Walner really likes to do large sweeping attacks, something that for the most part don't actually matter, but sometimes he'll roll to dodge the attack, only for them to get stuck in his arm and get dragged under his main body, which is pretty much a guaranteed death. I used to think this was somewhat of a rare thing to happen, but as I was replaying Dark Souls 3 as preparation for this video, I ended up dying several times in a room. It is honestly a shame that the actual fight part of Walner is so bad when everything else is done so well. Guardian Drake is another fight where I don't really have much to say. There isn't really anything to this fight. All that happens is that the dragon flies around, breathes fires in a specific spot in the arena, comes down, you hit it a few times and then it flies away again, rinse repeat until the boss is dead. You'll spend more time waiting as the dragon flies around you than you will actually do fighting it. I think Dark Souls 2 could have easily done without this one. This one pains me a bit to put so low as I really like Ceaseless Discharge. From its design to his lore to the way you start the fight, everything outside of the actual fight part is really well done. But this is a boss fight terror list after all, and the fighting part of Ceaseless is extremely underwhelming. Basically, what FromSoft intends for you to do is trigger the fight and then run all the way to the start of the boss arena again, where Ceaseless will jump for you and hang off the edge. All you need to do from here is hit his arm a couple of times and then the fight is over. Sounds simple, right? Well, as a new player, there is no way for you to know this. There are no other fights like this in Dark Souls 1, or in the rest of the series for that matter. There isn't really any indication that you're meant to run back to the start, and even if you manage to luck out and do what FromSoft intends for you to do, there is still a pretty big chance that Ceaseless will just spam ranged attacks instead of jumping, like he's actually meant to. As a whole, this fight is unintuitive and buggy. Such a shame for what is otherwise a really cool boss. And we're back to Dark Souls 2, and god I wish we weren't. <laughs> Not going to lie, there isn't really much to say about the old Iron King. This entire fight is just this dude slamming his hands down and you hitting them. He has like 3 moves he'll do, all being extremely easy to dodge. He might have been kind of annoying to fight if it weren't for the fact that once he slams his hands down, they stand down for a comically long amount of time. It's not like his hands get stuck in anything or something like that, no, he just lets them sit there for no reason. It's actually beyond me why Frostoff decided to make one of the Lord Souls one of the blendest and easiest fights in the entire game. Quite literally, the hardest part about this fight is trying to not fall into the tiny hole that is in his arena. Honestly, this fight had some potential. It's obviously based on the Gargoyles fire from Dark Souls 1, which is honestly a fight I do enjoy quite a bit, as you'll see from his placement later in the video. But the potential is about all it has, as the fight is actually pretty awful. Individually, the gargoyles have very boring movesets, where they only have a couple of moves they will use, so fighting them alone is boring. But that's where you're in luck, as there is a million of them in the fight. While I was fighting them again for this video, I ended up fighting four of them at once, which was mostly a result of the boss layering attacks in such a way where I couldn't kill them fast enough. So most of the fight was just spent running around, getting in a few attacks where I could until I whittled them down. I don't understand how they have the basis for a good fight, Two gargoyles have basic moveset, where one is mainly ranged and one is mainly melee, which makes for an interesting fight, and then managed to make it this much of a shitfest. There is nothing in this fight, all they did was make them all melee, give them less moves, and make more of them. It's like they thought adding more of an enemy is a reasonable way of making a fight harder. Such a waste. Also, the run back is a massive pain. <laughs> Now this is a fight that dropped quite a bit after replaying Dark Souls 1 again for this video. I used to think it was a mediocre fight with not a lot going on with it, but man did I as I rose into glasses. Centipede Demon is honestly one of the most annoying fights in Dark Souls 1. You will spend most of your time under the boss, where you can't really see what's going on, just swinging wildly, with the boss occasionally jumping straight up, leaving you guessing for the first couple of times when he's actually going to land. The arena the boss is in doesn't really add anything except for frustration, as the only time it really comes into play is when the boss manages to knock you into the lava and does a million more damage than the initial hit did. You might counter this by saying just cut off his tail and get the ring early, but there isn't really any indication that this is something you can do. Sure, there have been several bosses so far that have had mechanics where you could cut off the tail, but never has it given you something that directly interacted with the fight. 
and it's not even clear that this thing has a tail. The only saving grace for this fight is that the boss itself is very squishy by the time you get here, and you will most likely kill it in a few combos, making the annoying parts kind of obsolete. I feel like most of you watching this probably expected Midnight Butterfly to be further down the list, and that is honestly fair. There isn't really anything particularly interesting about the fight, as you will spend most of it just waiting for it to come close so you can actually hit it. The reason why I rate Moonlight Butterfly higher than a fight like Guardian Drake, which is pretty much the same type of fight, is that Moonlight Butterfly at least makes you actively dodge things while you wait. For most of Guardian Drake, you are just stood still waiting or you're running in a straight line, but with the Moonlight Butterfly, you need to actually dodge roll into its attack, even if they are really suited to dodge. I don't by any means think it's a good fight, but as far as this type of fight goes, it's not the worst. And to end off our little streak of Dark Souls 1 bosses, we have Stray Demon. I find the placement of this boss to be kind of unfortunate, as it's just the Asylum Demon reused with one new move. I would much rather properly explain the boss when I get to Asylum Demon, so I'll just do that. Rather, in this segment, I'll explain why I think it's a worse fight despite only adding to the original fight. First off, the way you start the fight is fairly cheap. There isn't really any realistic way of knowing that the floor can cave in like it does. Even if you bait the enemies around it to run over it, it won't do anything. I find it to be a cheap gotcha, and on top of that, there is no way of avoiding the full damage, even when you know about the drop. Next up, you have the part where if you don't clear the trash before you start the fight, there is a decent chance that they'll fall into the hole with you, making the fight more annoying than it was intended to be. I would prefer if they just added an invisible wall around it so that the mobs can't run over it. This would also solve the problem of them running across it without triggering the drop. Lastly, the added mechanic to the boss aren't even good. All they added to it was one attack where the demon does a big AoE in front of it. The reason why I think this is a bit of a shit attack is that the animation for this attack is not very well defined, making it fairly hard to even figure out where the attack ends. So yeah, I think this was a completely unnecessary reuse of a boss, especially considering that they will later reuse the boss for a third time anyways. Next up you have the sixth ad fight of the bad tier, Deacons of the Deep. And just like all the other ad fights, it's a bit shit. Pretty much the whole gimmick for this fight is that you want to attack the enemy that is glowing. Do this enough, and the actual boss will spawn. From here on, the rest of the fight is honestly just R1 spamming the boss, trying to also hit the fat dudes next to him at the same time so they can't use miracles to push you away. This is another fight that is honestly pretty impossible to actually die to, as both the adds and the boss are very squishy and barely do any damage. The only real way to die is to overestimate the boss and playing it too safe, which will most likely end with them getting their big cast off killing you. But you really only need to die once to understand how do you meant to fight the boss. In a way, Deacons of the Deep is just Royal Rat Vanguard done better, with better visuals and more mechanics. It doesn't really save it from being based on a bad concept to begin with though. Man, I'm honestly not even sure why this boss is this far off. It's honestly a stretch to call this even a boss. There are world bosses in Elden Ring that have more complex mechanics that I didn't even include in this video. This fight is basically just a glorified damage sponge as all you can do is just stand in front of one of his back legs and spam R1. So occasionally fly off and do some fire stuff, it doesn't really matter, just get back to his back leg and go off. Now see, this is all bad enough, but by far the worst part of this fight is the run back. Holy fuck, I have never been more tilted in my life than when I somehow managed to die and had to run back to the boss. There are actually a million dudes just stood in front of the boss room, and because of the way fog walls work in Dark Souls 2, you can't even just run past them and go into the boss, as the enemies will just hit you out of the animation. I easily spent way longer trying to get back into the fight than I actually did to fight the boss. Mendrick is another fight where there isn't really all that much to say about him. He's just some tall lanky dude walking around in a room. He has like two moves that he can do, both really plain swings of his swords. He does have an interesting mechanic where you need the giant souls to be able to do more damage to him, but this isn't really communicated very well or at all to you unless you get told by someone else or just give up and look it up. Getting all of the giant souls is a massive pain in the ass, so you'll most likely do it while missing a few, making him pretty tanky. This wouldn't be that much of an issue if it weren't for the fact that Vendrick does surprisingly high damage and can chain hit you if you're unlucky, effectively hundred desiring you without counterplay. Obviously it's your fault for getting hit, but the fight is so boring that there's a decent chance that you'll slip up and just not really be paying attention. It's a bit of a shame though, as Vendrick is a pretty cool character and I would have really liked to have a proper showdown against him when he was in his prime but instead we get this joke of a fight. Miklash is another one of those fights where I really like everything about the fight, except for the fight itself. 
The setup, the boss, the way he speaks during the fight, the music, everything is done really well. And then you actually do the fight and it just sucks. The entire fight pretty much boils down to chasing some random crazy dude and having to do a quote unquote puzzle where you lead him into a room where he'll finally stay. From here the rest of the fight is just beating up some NPC with three moves that he can do, none of which are particularly hard to dodge. Like most NPC fights, he's very easy to just play super aggro against and just stunlock him with spamming R1. Somehow the part where you chase him around is harder than the fight itself. I place it this high purely for the aspects of the fight that I listed before, but it still ends up being in the bad tier as nothing can save a fight this bad. I think this might be the most disappointing fight in all of Dark Souls 2. The Soul series usually has a tendency to end strong with a good final fight. And before you comment about how Nashandra isn't the actual final fight of the game, just give me a minute, we'll get to Aldea in a second, probably sooner than you're expecting. Now onto why I find this fight to be so disappointing, and to be honest, the fight is just a massive letdown. There isn't really all that much build up for this fight. You do get to meet Nashandra once while in the castle, but it doesn't really do much to build her own fight up, and it's mainly there to give you more backstory on the kingdom and Vendrick. That being said, I do think her design is cool, and the way the Emerald Herald warns you that she is coming for you is also pretty cool, but it just isn't enough. And then we get to the fight itself, and no boy does it only get worse from here. Nashandra is honestly one of the most boring fights in the entire game. She barely has any moves, and the ones she does have are just straight up boring. For the most part she'll just be swinging her scythe at you while occasionally doing a laser attack that's very easy to dodge. She does have the mechanic where she'll summon humanity looking things around her that curse you, but they honestly don't really do anything and you, and you can for the most part just ignore them and rush Nishandra down. She's fairly squishy and doesn't really do that much damage. I don't know what it is with Dark Souls 2 and just having really boring movesets, but this is what the result is, a lot of really bland finds. It's just such a shame that it affected the last boss as well. Okay, so I feel like Half-Light is a hard one to judge, since the fight is going to be very different each time you fight it. Or, well, that's assuming you fought it back at the release of the Ring City DLC. Because of the fact that at the time of writing this, the servers for Dark Souls 3 have been down for several months, I'm going to write it on the quality of the NPC version of the fight, and not the Invasion version. You might disagree with this, but you honestly would also disagree with my placement of the Invasion version regardless, so this is probably the lesser of two evils for you. Okay, now onto the fight itself. It kinda sucks. This is mainly a problem that all Dark Souls games have had. Fights against NPCs are just kinda bad. It's far too easy to just walk up to them and R1 spam to stunlock them. Half-Light kinda saves this by having a decent amount of ranged attacks to keep you away, but this only works for a little while until you figure out this move sets. It does also have adds that spawn in during the fight, but they are very easy to kill without Half-Light being able to do anything about it. Overall, it's just a really disappointing fight and barely even counts as that in its current state. It's kind of a neat idea, but it isn't really done any better than it was done in Demon Souls, which came out almost a decade before it. See, this is another one of those unfortunate fights where I think everything about it is great, except for the fight itself. I looked into deeper, I found Seath to be one of the most interesting characters in Dark Souls 1. There's a lot of great lore and unique design. Even the opening cutscene does a great job of building him up, but then comes his actual fight. Seath, like most of the other big bosses in the series, suffer a lot from their size. I find bigger bosses to be annoying to fight, as you usually will struggle to actually see what is happening, and tend to just spam attacks and face tank whatever attack they send at you. This also applies to Seath. I think all in all, Seath has about 4 or 5 moves that he'll rotate through, most of which won't even hit you as long as you just hug his side or behind him. The mechanic where you destroy the little needle to make him vulnerable is okay, but honestly this doesn't make much sense in lore, because there's no way he would leave the only thing making him immortal just chilling around with no defenses. And yeah, I know there are a bunch of golems and stuff outside, but that's still light defenses for how important it is to him. So yeah. I find Seath to be extremely disappointing, made even worse by the fact that there is a much better dragon fight later on in the game, but we'll get to that in a couple of tiers. This might honestly also be a bit of a controversial one, as I feel as a lot of people that enjoy Dark Souls 2 also enjoy this fight, but hopefully you'll see where I'm coming from by the end of this. I start off with the fact that it's going to become blatantly always by the end of this video. I'm not a big fan of duo fights. That's not to say that I don't like any duo fights, as there is one extremely high on my list, but for the most part I just don't think they're particularly well done. The main fault I find with this duo fight is that I don't think the two bosses play off each other particularly well. It just feels like you are fighting two individual bosses put together. 
Some of you might disagree with this and think that they made one slow and one fast, and I somewhat agree that it feels like they tried to do that, but in reality I just don't think it were. For most of the fight they will both be coming at you at the same time, constantly laying their attacks in such a way where you rarely get attacks in, making the fight still doable but extremely tedious. Even when one of them backs off, leaving one in melee, it can be hard to get hits in as the one in the back will just throw magic at you instead. Another problem I have with this fight that some of you might actually like is the revive mechanic. If you don't know, then basically in this fight, if you kill one of them and enough time passes, it will revive, making it so you have to kill both of them fairly close to each other. I don't even think this is a bad mechanic to add to a fight, I just don't think it works that well for this particular fight. So yeah, that's basically what I like about the fight. The actual boss and their movesets are fine, and I don't have a problem with them, it's just that when you put them together I start hating it. I'm not even ashamed to admit that this is the only boss that I summoned for in any of the Dark Souls games. Now on to the other contender for most disappointing find in Dark Souls 2, which is coincidentally the other final boss of the game. I don't know what it is about Dark Souls 2, but they just couldn't for the life of them make a decent final boss. Now, I like Oldia. He has cool lore, decent design, and a good build up where you meet him several times throughout the game, all culminating in a very lackluster fight. To really highlight just how boring this fight is, I can sum it up in one sentence. Attack while fire is off? Do basically nothing while the fire is on. That's the entire fight, and my god is it boring. I think I just really hate fights where there is a lot of downtime where I can't do anything. I much prefer fights where I'm actively fighting the boss and having to constantly be either dodging or weaving in attacks. But Aldia is the complete opposite of that as you spend most of the fight just standing there waiting for him to do his big attacks so the flames will go out. It's honestly just tedious. That being said, he was still somehow less disappointing than Nashandra, so I guess there's something positive about it. Okay, so remember a few minutes ago when I said Throne Defender was the only fight I summoned for? Yeah, I, I, I might have lied. I was to summon for this fight, but come on, nobody likes this fight, right? You all did the same, right? So I don't really have that much to say about this fight either, as most of it was said during the Throne Defender segment. It's another duo fight where it just feels like two enemies were just put together, but not all that much thought put into how well they play off of each other. Just like Throne Defender, you can't even just rush down one of the bosses fast to make it a 1v1, as the one left will just res the one that died. At least there's a saving grace where they share health so you don't actually need to kill both at the same time this time. The only reason I put this fight higher on the list is because, at the very least, this fight was in Elden Ring, so there's a million different ways where you can just cheese the fight and make it really easy, and thank god for that. Old Demon King honestly might be the fight that dropped the most ratings after I replayed the games for this video. I used to think it was just this 5 out of 10 mediocre fight with not much to him, but after fighting him again, I might genuinely hate him. Bit of a disclaimer in this one, a lot of the reason I don't like this fight comes from only playing melee, and I think this is one of the bosses in the series that punishes melee the most. Most of his attacks punish you for being melee, and don't really affect you for your range, so let's get through a few of them. The attack where he taps the ground a couple of times and spawns a flame circle can be arranged if you are arranged, but not as a melee. The hitbox also feels really arbitrary, making it annoying to dodge. Most of his melee attacks are crazy fast compared to anything else at this point in the game, and are genuinely hard to react to even if you are a veteran. His fire breathing move is really annoying as all he does is just breathe fire under him. It's really easy to dodge, but you can't damage him as he does this, so you just have to run around and wait. To add to that, his favorite move, the one where he shoots meteors at you, pretty much does the exact same thing. You are forced to pull off the boss and hide behind the debris in the arena, making it so you can't attack him as a melee. And to top it all off, there's this weird bug when you fight him as a melee where your lockup was just randomly drawn. This isn't even a rare occurrence as it happened several times when I fought him again for this video. Though it's not like it's all bad. This mechanic where he starts burning and becomes stronger for a while only to burn out and become weak is a pretty good mechanic and I think it's a bit wasted on this boss. I think if they were fine this mechanic they could bring it back and make a very good fight out of it. But as it stands, the old Demon King is just really tedious to fight with not a lot of good aspects. At least for melee players. I think the Demon of Hatred is a bit of an unfortunate, as it is an amalgamation of a lot of things I don't like in the Souls bosses. First off, he's big. Really big. This isn't really much of a problem at the start, but as the fight goes on and he gets more and more moves, it becomes harder and harder to really tell what he is doing if you're playing the game aggressively, something Sekiro actively encourages you to do. Secondly, Demon of Hatred takes in use a mechanic that isn't really used in any other point of the game, that being that you can jump over him to dodge his charge. I don't think this is particularly well explained or shown to the player in order for you to know that this is even possible, and without knowing this, the fight is pretty much impossible. 
I know it's a pretty obvious opinion about this boss, but I genuinely think that this would fit more in Bloodborne, and it makes me think that it was a scrap Bloodborne boss that was reused for Sekiro. But yeah, not much else to say about him honestly, just a bad fit for a game where I think almost all the other bosses are great. Now, I think this will easily be my most controversial opinion on this entire list, so let me try and at least somewhat explain where I'm coming from. To start off, let's point out the most obvious thing about the fight that immediately makes it lose some points for me. He's a dragon, he's massive, he's unreasonably tanky so his fight takes ages, and despite this he has several ways of one-shotting the player. And as a minor note, his runback is also a pain. So let's get a bit more in-depth about these points, starting with his size. At least for Medir, most of my problems about his size don't actually come from not being able to see what he's doing this time, but centers around how you pretty much have to hit his head. So if you didn't know, Medir has a mechanic where he takes heavily reduced damage if you hit anything that is in his head, more or less forcing you to hit his head. This on his own isn't that bad, but when combined with the fact that he is massive and really likes to move his head a lot, there simply just aren't all that many chances for you to go for hits. This is made infinitely more frustrating when combine that with just how insanely tanky he is to begin with, making this fight way too long. Another complaint I have that ties to his HP is, is how little you get to hit him. Not only referring to how little time his head will spend down, but also just how little time you get to spend close to him in general. He has two different moves that he will use that just beats fire on top of himself so you need to run away. Combo this with his charge attack, and with the right RNG, there will be times where you have no opening to attack for almost an entire minute. This would be annoying on any boss, but it's just that much more frustrating when combined with his ludicrous health pool. I could go on, but I don't want this segment to go on as long as your average Madeir fight, so I'll end it here. Madeir is a fight that I really do want to enjoy, as he is really hard, but this just feels like one of those fights that is hard to be hard, so he ends up just being frustrating instead. Alright, moving on to the lackluster tier, I feel like I need to do some more explaining on my definitions of these tiers. Like I said previously, the bad tier was for bosses where I thought the fights were underwhelming and were somewhat frustrating or just poorly thought out. For the lackluster tier, I mainly placed fights which I thought were boring, but they were for the most part too easy to really find annoying therefore giving them a higher placing than the fights from the bad tier. Now, if the lackluster tier is technically worse than the bad tier is more of a personal preference, and was something that I considered for a while, but eventually I decided on ranking them in this order. I guess I just find it easier to excuse a boring fight than a frustrating or annoying fight. One positive about this tier is that despite there being a lot of bosses, it's not really going to take that long as there isn't too much to say about each fight. But yeah, let's finally actually get to the first boss, the Witch of Hemway. The Witch of Hemic is a really boring fight, so boring that I contemplated putting her into the bad tier. But upon replaying, I felt like that she was so easy it wasn't even worth it. The entire fight boils down to running around and hitting the witch, or I guess it would be the witches. If you have inside when you do this, there are also adds that will spawn, but you can completely avoid this by just using up all your inside before the fight. Even if you do this, it doesn't really matter as the adds are really weak, making the fight extremely easy either way. Not that much more to say about it honestly, so let's just move on to the next fight. This video is long enough as it is already, so instead of writing out a full paragraph of this boss, I'll just sum him up by reading my notes that I wrote as I was replaying the game. Also pretty much a joke fight, super easy, has like 3 moves, bad, boring, not a single clue why they made this boss and placed him where they did, wild. Last Dragon Rider is honestly just a bit of an unfortunate fight, as the most common way of fighting him is by just instantly killing him. I wouldn't really count this towards him though, as it's a way of cheesing him, even if it happens fairly often even when you don't try to do it. Outside of this exploit, there isn't really much to say about him. He has a very slow and bland move sets where he doesn't really do anything but basic swings with his weapon. The most interesting part about this fight is the mechanic where you can raise platforms to make his arena bigger, but even this isn't that interesting. So for the sake of the length of this already way too long video, I'm just going to pair both the Smelter Demons into the same segment, as they are essentially the same boss. On its own, the Smelter Demon isn't even that bad of a fight, most of my hatred for this boss comes from two things. Firstly, he's extremely anti-melee, with both his constant damaging aura, but also his AoE explosions that he does. As someone who only ever does melee, he has been a massive chore to fight for this reason. Secondly, and this technically has nothing to do with the fight, but holy fuck does this boss have the absolute worst run back of any boss in Dark Souls 2. Which says a lot, since Dark Souls 2 occupies like 15 slots in the top 10 worst run backs. By placing as many enemies as they did in front of the frog gate, they pretty much guarantee that you would have to kill a lot of enemies on your way back to the boss every single time. This got so bad that by the time I actually killed the boss, I had killed the mob so many times that they just stopped respawning altogether, so I could actually finally attempt the boss. 
In total, I would say I spent way more time trying to get to the boss than I ever spent trying to actually defeat the boss. I spent so goddamn long trying to get to this boss that I honestly placed it this low purely out of spite and I have no problem with that. On their own, the rune sentinels are honestly fine. Most of my problems with them stem from the fact that there are three of them. I do have some minor gripes with them, like the fact that the first boss you fight sometimes just bug out and jump off the ledge early, forcing you to fight all three at once. Rune Sentinels is just another one of those fights where it's a bunch of individual enemies placed in the same room and called a boss fight. They don't really synergize with each other at all, making the fight just a bit boring. At least this one isn't all that hard. Now, the Blazing Bull is one that I would partly take some blame for. When it comes to the Souls games, I'm a bit of a purist. As more of the games have come out and each have had new and different mechanics added to them, I've been a bit of a stubborn old man and refused to really interact with them. So when it comes to Sekiro, I didn't really ever use any of the ninja tools. So when it came to the Blazing Bull, a fight that is made with a certain ninja tool in mind, it does tank the quality to a certain extent. This being said, even with the firecrackers, I don't really think it's a particularly good fight. If you fight it in the proper way, he's just frustrating as he constantly charges at you. But if you do fight him as you were intended with counters and firecrackers, he's a complete joke, making him a case of bad if you do, bad if you don't. Demon of Song is another one of those bosses that doesn't really do anything bad, but doesn't really do anything good either. Summed up, he has a decent moveset with nothing really interesting, just a bunch of slam attacks. He does have a unique mechanic where he'll hide inside his skin, but this just artificially makes the fight longer as you wait for him to come out again. This could have been more interesting if they made him do literally anything during this time, but no, he just kind of sits there. So other than the sign, he's probably one of the most forgettable bosses in the entire series. Priscilla is another fight where I wasn't really sure if I was going to be including it, but most wikis and people in general seem to classify her as a boss, so I thought I might as well. That being said, I wouldn't really harp on her too much. It's clear that she's just a bit of extra content and you aren't even really meant to fight her at all. Her moveset's okay, her stealth mechanic is actually kind of cool, but the fact that she's extremely squishy, plus her very lacking moveset, makes her an overall lackluster boss. Cute tell though. I'm starting to feel like I'm repeating myself a lot, but this is another boss that suffers from his eyes. If you fight the giant lord like you fight the last giant, you won't really be able to see what is going on. But much like the last giant, it doesn't really matter as you can just rush the boss down before you can really do anything about it. To be fair to the giant lord, he does have an actual way you're meant to fight him. And that is by fighting him on the ledge next to him. This way your camera is higher and you can actually see everything he does. This does somewhat improve his fight, but it's still really easy. His moveset is way too bond and pretty much just boils down to him slamming his sword down at you, making him a slightly harder ceaseless. You might have thought that we were done with them, but no, here is yet another ad fight. I've ragged on ad fights enough in this tier list, so I'll just explain why I rate Celestial Emissary higher than the rest and move on. So it basically just boils down to the fact that this fight is in Bloodborne, and the rest aren't. The type of fight just fits better with the faster flow of Bloodborne's combat, making the fight more bearable. It is still an ad fight, so it plays is pretty low, just not as low as the rest. Crystal Stage is another one of those fights that there isn't really anything wrong with, it's just a bit bare bones mechanics wise, but probably should have been put a bit earlier in the game for how simple she is. Her puzzle mechanic is a neat idea, but it's something a child could figure out at a glance, so it becomes too simple for an entire fight to lean on. It's an okay fight, just a bit boring. My thoughts on Flexa Sentry are very similar to my thoughts on Crystal Sage. The fight itself isn't bad, as there isn't anything in it to make it bad, it just ends up being a bit bland. It has several mechanics to it that I think are really interesting, like it having two upper bodies, which in turn gives it two movesets. The problem is that the fight is so easy that the boss doesn't really get to utilize the mechanic during the fight. You just kinda pick a side and then fight him normally. Same thing with the mechanic of water filling the room as you fight. This is honestly a mechanic that several of you watching this video probably didn't even know about. As the fight goes on, more and more water will fill the room, eventually making it so deep that it slows your movement. It's a neat idea on its own, but it just doesn't get to do anything when the boss dies in a few seconds. Flexile Sentry has several good ideas, they just aren't executed that well. I really hope that From Sub ends up reusing some of them in their upcoming games. So after a couple of bosses with good mechanics that don't matter, comes a boss with a terrible mechanic that doesn't matter, Mitha. So I'm just going to be blunt, her poison mechanic is just straight up bad. The fight is pretty much undoable if you don't drain the poison first, which isn't really great. Doesn't really make it any better that the way you drain the poison doesn't even make any sense, and most people don't even find that out on their own and are either told about it or just look it up. And when you do drain the poisons, she's just another Dark Souls 2 boss, a boss with a really generic moveset that is easy to dodge, making her overall boring. The only reason she ranks higher is because her moveset is slightly more interesting than Flexile Sentry and Crystal Sage, but only by a minuscule amount. 
You might have expected this fight to be a bit lower, as it is a duo fight that is literally just a boss that has been doubled up and called a boss fight. But I don't really take an issue with the duo aspect of this fight. The main reason I don't is because it's extremely easy to just make the melee dragon rider knock the ranged one down. From here, you just need to kill the ranged dragon rider, which takes like one combo as he's extremely squishy. After that, you're just left with the exact same boss as the original dragon rider you've already fought, but with his stats improved, making it for a tiny bit more of an interesting fight. The only reason I place it higher on the list than the original dragon rider is that by placing two bosses, you make it a tiny bit more interesting, but it's by no means an actually good fight, which is why it's still in the lackluster tier. This is another fight where I don't really have much to say about it, which I guess is kind of the point of this tier. The one we're born in both visual design and combat design is just a giant blob. Fight-wise, all he does is just sometimes kick you with one of his thousands of legs, or use his magic to drown you in sludge. Other than that, you'll just be running around trying to kill all the ads around him, or just laying into him. He's also another one of those bosses who are so big that it's just hard to tell what is happening, but I've talked way too much about that already, so let's just move on. Pinwheel might just be one of the weirdest bosses in Dark Souls 1. There are just so many things about him that doesn't make sense, to the point where I have no idea what FromSoft are thinking. Everything about Pinwheel suggests that he's supposed to be fought decently early, both in the fact that he is extremely simple, and the fact that he gives the right of kindling. And if that was the case, then he probably would be a fair amount higher on my list. But the problem is that the game does a plethora of things to stop you from fighting him early. When players first arrive in Firelink, it isn't all that uncommon for him to go to the graveyard first, to then get their ass kicked by the skeletons. Even though it feels like it was intended to deter new players from going to the catacombs first, it also makes it so that there's no way for you to accidentally stumble upon Pinwheel early. I don't know, Pinwheel isn't even that bad of a fight if you fight him at an appropriate level. He actually gets to use his clones, and the fight can even become somewhat difficult if you don't kill him fast enough. Problem is that realistically, that's never going to happen, as you're always going to fight him when you're way overleveled, as you're actively discouraged from actually going here before you get the Lord Vessel. I wish I could place him higher, but as it stands, he's just a wasted fight. Weirdly enough for how high I place Capradim in the Lycluster tier, I was actually contemplating putting him in the bad tier instead. This mostly comes down to his fight at the same time being Lycluster, but also just straight up annoying. One on one, the Capra Demon is a fairly easy fight, and most players, even early on, would have no problem taking him on. The problem is when you put him into the arena he is in. The two most obvious problems with the fight are the two dogs he has with him, and the arena itself. The dogs are less annoying as they die quite fast, but this is somewhat reliant on RNG since they can be irritating and constantly jump away from you. The bigger issue is the arena and how insanely small it is. Not only do you need to fight the Capra Demon and his dogs, but you also have to fight with your own camera to be able to see anything. In the end, the reason why I ended up putting him in the lackluster tier instead of the bad tier is that the fight, despite the dogs and the arena, is really easy. The stairs are in the arena makes splitting him up from the dogs easy, and it was also really useful for creating distance between you to heal. If it weren't for these stairs, I most likely would have put him in the bad tier though. Just as with Celestial Emissary, I don't really have much to say about the living failures that I haven't already said several times already. So I'll just explain why I think it's a better fight than Celestial Emissary and move on. The main reason I think it's a better fight overall is just that they're bigger and therefore less of them. It isn't as much of a slaughter as it is against Celestial Emissary, where I'm essentially just R1 spamming a bunch of small dudes until the big dude spawns. Still, the fight is pretty boring. The enemies themselves are really simple, and dodging the big meteor attack they do is really easy, and only slightly lengthens the fight. Not the worst ad fight, but it's still a lackluster fight overall. Alana's a bit of a weird one, and one I think most people disagree with me on. On paper, Alana's not a terrible fight. Her mechanic of spawning ads for you to fight is fairly interesting, but it's the way it's done where the fight starts falling apart. Basically, Alana has two options when it comes to what she can spawn. Either it's a group of skeletons that you can kill in one hit, or Velstad, a literal boss from earlier in the game. I think you can start and see where I'm going with this. When Alana spawns the skeletons, I think her fight is fine, her own attacks are decently fun to play against, and the skeletons just add a bit more difficulty on top, but not too much. All my problems with this fight comes from when Velsad is spawned. I don't know what they were thinking with this fight, but Velsad spawns in with pretty much the same health and damage as the actual boss fight. This combined with the fact that Alana is very much there and still very much attacking you makes this fight hell. You have the option of either killing Velstad or just running around until he despawns, but both of these are probably just going to end with Alana resummoning him again. This leaves the fight a pretty much a coin flip if it's an average fight that isn't that interesting, or one of the most frustrating fights in the entire game. This is why I eventually ended up putting her in the lackluster category, as it's somewhat in the middle of the two options. Let me just start off this segment by saying that I think Nito is really cool. His design is awesome, the fact that he's just a bunch of clumped up skeletons is pretty dope. The way he slowly lurks over to you as this hulking mass while using massive AoE spells is both terrifying and looks amazing. Everything presentation and lore wise is just superb, but then you actually fight him and oh boy is he disappointing. 
There are a lot of things I hate about this fight, so I'll try to be brief with each one. First up, you have to lose about half your HP every single time you start the fight, as there's no way to avoid taking full damage. The other very obvious thing are the skeletons that are in his arena. Other than making a divine weapon, there isn't really anything you can do about them other than just hoping that Nito kills them for you, and you can get in attacks while they put themselves together. Since, you know, you can't permanently kill skeletons in Dark Souls 1 without a divine weapon. This one's a bit more minor, but it's still very annoying your first time fighting him, and that is Nito's scream attack. Basically, Nito will sometimes scream, and after a certain delay, a soul will come out from the ground right under you, which will hit you no matter what unless you perfectly time a roll. On its own, this isn't that bad, but it's still an dodgeable attack until you get hit by it by a certain amount of time so you can learn the timing, so it ends up feeling like a pretty cheap attack compared to the rest of the game. And honestly, the worst part is, even if you remove all of these aspects from the fight and just fight him one on one, he's a really lackluster fight. He barely has any moves, it's like two different swings of his sword and then his worst attack where he sends out a big AoE around him, and if you're melee, you have no choice but to run away and then run back. Sometimes when you do this, he'll just cast it straight away again, making it so you can't even attack him for like 20-30 seconds at a time. It's honestly such a shame that a boss this cool got butchered so badly in his fight design. My boy Nito deserved so much better than this. Despite not being the highest, or I, or I guess lowest, boss in the lackluster tier, he might just be the most lackluster boss in the tier. Just in case you don't know, the way you fight Yorm is that you're given a special sword that shoots a giant wind current, which is basically the only realistic way you're killing him. On its own, I don't think this gimmick is that bad, and FromSoft will try this gimmick again later and do much, much better. But we'll get to that a bit later in the list. The main problem with how the Yorm fight uses this gimmick is that it makes it way too easy. Every time you hit Yorm with a special attack, it stuns him for a very long time, making so you can very easily just charge up the attack again and simply stun lock Yorm until he's dead. So as a Souls fight, I think Yorm is extremely lackluster, though he does somewhat succeed in being a good spectacle fight, which is the main reason I've placed him this high. I feel a bit bad for the folding screen monkeys. As a concept, the fight is honestly pretty good. It utilizes the new movement system in Sekiro with unlimited stamina and a grappling hook really well. The way you defeat the monkeys is varied and fits each monkey really well. My absolute favorite part is the fourth monkey though. Making it invisible as it is often the forgotten about monkey is honestly really quite clever. After all their praise, you might be a bit confused as to why I place it so low, and it mostly comes down to execution. While I think the way you defeat each monkey is clever, I don't think it's communicated to the player all that well. This leads to the fight devolving into players just running around chasing monkeys until they either get lucky and accidentally do the correct mechanic, or the AI bug and it lets you kill the monkey without it. If the fight had more of a lead up and hints from earlier in the game, I honestly think it might have been one of the best gimmick fights in the series, but instead it's just one of the fights with the most wasted potential. Freya is another one of those bosses which I originally didn't really mind, but my opinion on drastically dropped after fighting them again. My memory of my first time fighting them was okay. I remember somewhat struggling, but it felt fair and I didn't really have any problems with it overall. But after having more experience with different FromSoft games, I think it just hit home just how bland and simple the fight really is. First off are the ads, which are just kind of there, they don't really add anything to the fight except just being a bit annoying. Freya herself is not really much better though. She does have the mechanic though of having two heads and if you focus one too much it just kind of falls off forcing you to switch to the other one, which is admittedly pretty neat. Other than that she's just extremely simple, she has like three attacks that she'll use and all of them are just really easy to dodge. I think it's a bit of a shame as the build up to the fight and her design are both done pretty well, but once again Dark Souls 2 just drops the balls when it comes to the actual fight itself. Finally we get to the final boss in the lackluster tier, and coincidentally it's another spider boss. Well, I swear it's not my inner arachnophobia showing or anything, the bosses are just not that great. Well, despite taking the highest spot in the tier, I don't actually have that much to say about Rom, though I guess that makes sense given the tier. He is quite similar to Freya in the sense that he's just a big spider surrounded by other smaller spiders. I do think he's better than Freya though, in that Blobrun just straight up has the better gameplay and that his attacks are more varied and therefore more interesting to fight. So the ads are pretty much the same as in Freya's fight. They're just kind of there and don't really do much. Maybe you'll take a quick break from spamming R1 on the boss to clear out a few of them once in a while, but that's about it. There honestly isn't that much more of a difference between the two. Both are just very lackluster fights. Finally, we make it past the negative tiers and make it into the indifference tiers. What an upgrade. Just like with the previous tiers, I'll briefly explain what my criteria for the tier is. The OK tier is filled with what I consider to be OK fights, obviously. What I define as an OK fight are fights that don't really have anything special going for them, but they don't really have anything wrong with them either. 
As you see when we get into the tier, a lot of the bosses are the early game fights in each respective game. Being decent bosses for new players who are starting out, but full short when compared to more complex late game bosses. Also sadly, I will have to scrap my bar chart that I've been using as it isn't really all that applicable anymore, but I'm sure you'll manage with that. Now, with that out of the way, let's actually get into the tier. The last try might be the weakest first boss in this whole series, but I still don't think he's a bad boss. His moveset is simple, but still punishing if you do get hit. He teaches you about how and when to properly use the lock on. He also has a mini phase shift in the middle of the fight, showing you that this is something that will also be happening later on. I think he is overall the weakest first boss in this series as he's too simple. It takes way too long to actually get to him, so he ends up being far too weak compared to you. This is further exacerbated by putting the Pursuer right afterwards, who's significantly harder. This is made even more disappointing when Dark Souls 1 already had two fantastic first bosses that played off each other really well. All in all, he's a fight that would have benefited greatly from being a tiny bit earlier in the game, but he is still a pretty solid first boss compared to most other games. On his own, I think the Taro's Demon is fairly good for new players and is a very nice reincorporation of the previous mechanics taught to the player, like plunging attacks. His moveset is fairly simple and is similar to the Asylum Demon, but just that bit harder to make you feel like you're improving at the game when you finally beat him. The main downside holding back the fire from being higher on the list is that I think he might be a bit too easy. I think that they might have wanted to put him a bit later and make him a bit harder so he doesn't feel quite as much of a copy paste from the Asylum Demon as he currently does. He does also have a fair amount of weird bugs and glitches, most of which will result in either you or the ball being out of the arena. But overall, Taurus Demon is a pretty good first boss, so okay tier it is. The Gaping Dragon is like the tutorial fight for dragons. I don't think this was what it was intended to be, but it just kinda ended up this way from being an early game dragon fight. It has a lot of trademarks of dragon bosses such as breath attacks and a charge attack. You even fight him somewhat similarly where you just kinda lay into one of his legs, though he does crawl in his stomach so you're not under him, something I think helps a lot with his ability of his attacks. There is also the Chandler that is on the balcony over the fight who, who punishes you if you don't kill him by shooting at you and occasionally buffing the boss itself. This is one of the few times in the entire series there are elements that affect the fight that aren't in the arena itself, something I honestly like, or at least I think it was done well in this fight. I do have some gripes with the fight though, or well, mainly two gripes. Gaming Dragon likes to ever so slightly turn a lot, which will result in you taking a little bit of damage and getting staggered. On its own, this isn't all that bad, but when it happens as often as it does during the fight, it becomes tedious very quickly. Last thing is something that is really common with a lot of dragons, and that is our previously mentioned rush move. The fact that they have a move to rush forwards, creating distance between you and the dragon, isn't really a problem. The problem is that the attack has no startup animation, making it impossible to dodge. It honestly isn't that big of a deal, but any undodgeable attack is bad, so I thought I'd mention it. I'm just going to come out and say it. This is by far the most biased fight I rated, where I rated mostly on how I feel about the boss and conveniently ignoring the fight itself. As when it comes to the fight, Gwyndolin is extremely simple. He has a total of 3 attacks, none of them being particularly interesting or hard to dodge. Where Gwyndolin really shines is in lore, design, and build up. I'm not going to go into detail about his lore, I'll leave that up to you if you're interested, and I would strongly recommend that you look it up if you don't know about it. The parts I will talk about is the fact that Gwyndolin probably has one of the most interesting arenas in the entire series, despite it just being a hallway. The fact that it loops infinitely, yes I do know that it isn't actually infinite, and how his attacks are designed with the arena in mind is really cool. There is also the fact that he is the only covenant leader with an actual boss fight which is also really cool. So yeah, the actual fight is extremely lackluster, but everything else is done so well that I still regard it as an okay fight overall. And if you have a problem with that, fight me. This was honestly a fight I struggled a fair bit with placing. The Iron Golem is another gimmick fight. His gimmick being that once you hit him enough in one leg, he'll fall down. What FromSoft intended to happen was for him to fall off the arena one shotting him, but this very rarely actually plays out this way. What will happen most of the time is that you try to knock him off the edge, but he'll just bug and do some wild shit like we did in my playthrough, just casually floating in the air with not a care in the world. Gimmick aside, the fight itself is not all that bad. Just beating his legs until he dies doesn't take that long and is a very viable way of killing him. Like the Gaping Dragon, the Iron Golem also has an enemy outside the arena that affects the fight itself, further reinforcing the idea that you should explore around the boss before challenging them. Though even ignoring the bugs revolving around his gimmick, he still has plenty of bugs, the most frustrating of which are related to his grab attack. This grab attack can hit you basically no matter where you are, in your role or in the arena. And just if that's not bad enough, if you do get grabbed, you'll most likely die since he loves to throw you out of the arena. There are also a bunch of minor bugs, but I won't be going into them here. All in all, Iron Golem is a gimmick fight which doesn't really use his own gimmick, but somehow manages to end up being okay. And honestly, I'm not complaining. 
And finally, we get to the second use of the Asylum Demon, even though we still haven't even talked about the original fight. It is pretty hard talking about this fight without having talked about the first Asylum Demon fight, so I'm just going to go off the assumption that you have fought the Asylum Demon yourself. So, this is probably going to sound a bit weird seeing how Demon Fire Sage is lower on the list than Asylum Demon, but I personally think that Demon Fire Sage is a better boss. This mostly comes from the fact that the Demon Fire Sage is much later in the game and therefore have a lot more added to it. But why I think Asylum Demon is overall better is going to be explained when I actually finally talk about him. So I guess you just have to keep watching to find out. I do think that the few attacks that were added did improve this fight, but at the same time it is dragged down by the fact that this is the third time you fight this boss. Because of the Stray Demon, the Demon Fire Sage just feels like another rehash and doesn't really do enough to differentiate itself from the two other fights. All in all, Demon Fire Sage is a very decent fight, but it's dragged down by being a rehash of a rehash. Yet another fight I had a problem with ranking. Divine Dragon doesn't even really feel like a fight. It feels like one of those set pieces you see in Call of Duty campaigns. Okay, that might be a bit of a stretch, but I do hope you can see where I'm coming from. The Divine Dragon fight doesn't really feel like it is here because it is a fight, it's more of a spectacle that the player is taking part in. And I have to admit, it is pretty fucking dope. Jumping high in the air, catching lightning and sending it back, everything just makes you feel like a complete badass, and I do like those aspects of the fight. I only start having problems with it when rating it as a fight, since it isn't what you would traditionally call a fight in the Soul series. So in the end, my solution was to just place it in the middle of the list. It's not bad, it's not good, but it is a real spectacle. After having just done a fight I had a hard time placing, now we move on to one I found really easy to place. Sanctuary Guardian is what I like to call a filler boss. There's basically no lore on this guy, no build up, he's just kinda there at the very side of the DLC. His moveset is fairly challenging, but not so hard that you won't kill him on your first or second try. Overall, he's a decent boss, but at the same time, most likely that one boss that you always forget about when talking about Souls bosses, which is why I place him in the middle of the OK tier. From an actual fellow boss to one that just feels like one, despite being one of the four Lord Souls in Dark Souls 2. The Rotten is hard to talk about for the same reason he isn't that good of a boss. There is absolutely no substance to his fight. He's one of the four Lord Souls, but they still only gave him three to four moves, all of which are just him swinging his cleaver. That's it. He just stands there and swings at you. All of his attacks are really slow, though to be fair, they do pack a punch if you do somehow manage to get hit. There isn't really anything special about his arena, except for a few fire pits that don't really do anything. At the very least, he has a really easy run back, something that is rare for Dark Souls 2. Okay, so to be fair, this fight very easily could have been in lackluster. It has basically no moves, its special mechanic barely has any impact on the overall fight, and it honestly is a bit of a pain in the ass to even start the fight. But god damn, the boss mixed together with the visual of all the spirit animals as that absolute banger of a boss theme plays is honestly something quite special. I think it's my favourite track in the entire game, and it does some heavy lifting for this fight. Despite it being in the OK tier, I think the Curse Rod of Greatwood is one of the best executed gaming fights in the entire series. Its unique mechanic where you have the hidden in its white possibles is for the most part good. There are times when it becomes frustrating, like when it places them into the ground so you can't hit them. But it doesn't happen that often. The ads at the start don't really affect the fight at all since you'll just kill them all right at the start of the fight, and even if he misses a few, they'll die at the phase change anyways. Speaking of the phase change, it's also one of the better ones in the series. It is genuinely surprising the first time it happens. Other than some wonky hitboxes, this is one of the examples of a gimmick fight done right. Old Dragon Slayer is one of the best examples of a boss that probably would be higher in the list if it was in a different game. The fight itself is quite good. He's a varied moveset with a lot of cool callbacks to the original Ornstein. He even starts the fight the same way as Ornstein does. The only reason I rate him as low as I do is because he's in Dark Souls 2. You might think this is unfair, and it probably is, but when the only problem with the fight I can think of are directly from the game and not the fight itself, it's just kinda how it works out. More specifically, the problem I have is that because you meet him so early, you're not going to have a lot of agility yet. This makes it so, if you dodge him properly, he will still constantly be hitting you with glancing blows. Getting hit by glancing blow in Dark Souls 2 is probably one of the most frustrating things in the entire game because you know that if it was any other Souls game, you would have been fine as you dodged properly. So yeah, it is a shame that I end up rating him this low, but I don't really see a way around it. Finally, we get to wrap up the Lord Souls of Dark Souls 2, and we aren't even out of the OK tier yet. Yeesh. Lost Sinner, as with most other bosses in Dark Souls 2, isn't really a bad fight, it's just a really lackluster one. Here you are, about to face off with one of the strongest entities that you know of in the game at this point. You start building up a mental image of what this fight might be like, what kind of cool design and attacks they could have given them. 
and then you get to her, start the fight, and then immediately realize that she's yet another humanoid enemy with a sword who has four moves, all of which are just swinging her sword. The one saving grace being that she has at least a jump, so that's kinda cool. To be fair, she does have some extra mechanics where you can light the fires outside the arena to light up the boss fight, something that I do think is kinda cool, but overall it just doesn't add that much to the fight itself. And for the love of god don't fight her in New Game Plus like I did to try and get the Chaos Blade, it makes the fight way way worse. Don't really have much to say about this one. Much like the Sanctuary Guardian, Red Wolf of Radagon is another filler box. But to be fair to him, he has done quite well. His mix of normal animal moveset and magic attacks is quite unique for the series and works really well. He's a boss that really likes to jump around a lot, but that includes jumping into melee range so he isn't frustrating to fight as a melee. If anything, he's probably more frustrating as a range build for once. So yeah, good filler boss, good job from some. Okay, so I understand that this might be a bit of a leap from Red Wolf of Radagon to Fortisax, but let me explain. Fortisax is a dragon boss, so is it really my fault? Okay, in all seriousness, I don't think Fortisax is a particularly good boss. He's yet another dragon boss that uses the exact same moveset as every other dragon in Elden Ring. Except for one, but we'll get to him a bit later. He does have a few attacks where he uses lightning, but most of these just boils down to him slamming lightning into the ground, and you having to watch out and jump over or roll through. He does have a unique mechanic where every now and then he'll place lightning on you, and after a set amount of time it will pop and do a lightning strike where you were standing when it popped. I don't really like this mechanic, it doesn't really achieve anything other than punish melee for being in melee range, as it will only apply to you if you're under him. I really wish FromSod would come up with an interesting way of solving the fact that dragon fights just aren't all that good, instead of making up these arbitrary things that punish you for standing under dragons as you fight. As it stands, it just feels like I'm being punished for simply do what is the best strat for fighting against dragons as a melee. Four Kings is a fight with a lot of potential. Its unique mechanic of being a DPS check before it spawns another version of himself is good as it encourages and rewards you for playing aggressively. The FromSoft managed to screw it up just about as badly as they could have. See, Four Kings has two very major flaws. First, have you ever noticed that sometimes when you get hit by the Four Kings, he'll do basically no damage? Well, this is because Four Kings have two different hitboxes with his sword. One for the actual blade portion and one for the handle or his hand. If he hits you with the blade part, it will do full damage, but if he hits you with his hilt, he does about a tenth of what he normally would. This makes it so if you hug him really hard, there is pretty much no way for you to die, as he can't do anything but chip away at your health bar. The second thing is that he has an attack that cannot be dodged no matter what as long as he casts it. Specifically, I'm talking about the attack where he throws a giant purple disc at you. For some reason, FromSoft decided this was going to be a completely unavoidable attack. Even if it hits you during your iframes, it will do full damage. I have no clue why they did this, but it's a pretty big no-no when it comes to a game like Dark Souls. Luckily, FromSoft never really does another attack like this in any of the future games, so that's good at least. And here we have a second attempt at a PvP boss. Well, in this list at least. And yet again, it kinda falls flat. First of all, the summoning mechanic for this boss never really worked at all. I've played through Dark Souls 2 5 or 6 times in total, several of which were at the launch of the game, and I think I only ever saw him summon another player a single time. That being said, I'm honestly glad that this doesn't work as I find it to be the worst part of this fight. If it was just another PvP boss like in Demon's Souls and Dark Souls 3, then it would probably have been rated lower, next to Half-Life. The only reason it isn't is because the Looking Glass Knight himself is actually quite a good fight. Yes, he is another humanoid boss with a sword in Dark Souls 2, but at least he has a decent moveset. It is pretty slow, but it's readable. It's hard hitting when it hits and has enough magic moves to spice it up. He doesn't really have that many glancing blows issues as the other bosses, so there's that. Basically, if the fight had no summoning mechanic, he would be higher. If it had a more consistent one, then he would be lower. I think it's time for FromSoft to retire this gimmick and just make an actual decent PvP arena instead. The easiest way to sum up Ava is that she's just the Red Wolf of Radagon, but done better. She has a better mix of physical and magic attacks, making you actively think about both. I didn't personally find it to be a hard fight, but even then it was probably one of the fights that I enjoyed the most in the entire game, and I don't even usually like animal fights. The fight does end up being a bit slower paced, but that is inevitable when comparing a Dark Souls 2 fight to an Elden Ring fight. The fight is also enhanced if you happen to try and fight her before lifting the snowstorm. It makes for a cool reveal when you get to see what she actually looks like. That's about it. It's just a Red Wolf of Radagon, but better. Good job, B-Team. Overall, Sin is a cool fight. He's probably one of the most quote unquote realistic dragon fights. Fighting Sin feels like you're fighting a proper dragon for once. He flies about and breathes fire that covers huge areas of the arena. 
He has a massive HP pool. Most of his melee attacks are massive sweeping attacks that you have no choice but to roll. Fighting Sin straight up just feels cool. For a lot of people at least. For me, he's kind of boring. Sin commits what I'm quickly finding out is my cardinal sin of boss fights. He forces me to wait for extended periods of time. Despite being a dragon that has already been wounded, Sin really likes to fly. And as a melee player, there isn't really much for me to do when he's in the air. So I spend most of the time kind of just standing around, waiting for him to finally come down, so I can get a few hits in before he inevitably decides that he's going to do another flight. The actual fighting parts of the fight are pretty good, just a shame that there aren't more of them. If Midir isn't my most controversial placement, then this is it. Either way, this is going to be another one where I'm going to have to defend my opinion, so let's get to it. Firstly, and probably most importantly, this fight is extremely buggy. I can't tell you the amount of times where Ornstein has gotten stuck on Smo while doing an attack, holding the attack for 15 seconds, and then just randomly getting unleashed on me from nowhere. Or Smo casually pushing Ornstein forwards with his hammer, making so the attack that I just dodged now somehow hits. Or even times where one of them just straight up falls out of the arena. This has to be one of the most buggy fights in the entire game, if not the entire franchise. Don't worry though, because I do have some complaints about the actual fight as well. I admit, on paper, this fight sounds pretty good. One slow dude who's big, and a smaller dude who's quick. Sounds like the perfect recipe for a duo fight. So what's the problem? Well, the problem is that they don't synergize at all. Other than their sizes, speed, and lore, there isn't really anything to them that makes them feel like a duo. None of their attacks line up, no special mechanics between the two. Well, except for the phase change, but that's in a cutscene, so it hardly counts. Worst thing is, despite me saying several times that the sizes are a good idea, they didn't even manage to do that right. Smoke is supposed to be the big and slow enemy, but it's easily the most aggressive out of the two. He will constantly be running at you, doing his massive shoveling move. All the while, Ornstein is just vibing in the back, considering the perfect time to go in as to get stuck on Smo as much as possible. At the very least, I do agree with others that this fight is fairly hard for the first time around, but I don't think this is because the boss is well designed, but exactly the opposite. I do think this fight is hard, because it's really hard to get any hits in when they are constantly overlaying their attacks, leaving close to no openings. The only thing this fight tests is the player's patience. Amygdala is about as plain as a Bloodborne fight gets. There's not really anything interesting going on, it's pretty much just a beast fight. The fight is mainly carried by the fact that it's a Bloodborne fight, so its gameplay is top notch. The Amygdala also has a really interesting design that you get to see several times before you actually fight in, doing a great job of building up the fight. Other than this, there isn't really that much to say about it. It's just a really okay fight in what is otherwise a superb game. Essentially the first boss you fight in Sekiro, if you don't count the script to fight against Kenichiro, and it's honestly a really weird choice. Usually for the first fight of the game, Fromsa starts with some bigger, slower bosses to ease the players into it, and while Gyobu technically is larger than you, he is also the only mounted boss that you will fight in the entire game. Other than this, he essentially works the same as any other first boss. A fairly basic moveset consisting of mostly slow attacks that are easy to react to, though I do think he has a few problems with his moveset. He's fine when you're at a medium distance from him, but if you end up hugging him, he has several extremely fast attacks that are genuinely hard to react to, even for veterans. He has an attack where he runs around on his horrors before charging again. While he does this, you have an opportunity to grapple towards him and get a couple of hits in while he's in the air. This however, for some reason, will most likely end with him just hitting you while you're locked in the flying animation. I don't really get this, why give you the option to grapple him at all if it's going to end up you getting hit? What this does is signal to the player that using grapple mechanics in bosses is useless, something they did to me, as I never really used grapple mechanics in any of the boss fights. Other than these minor problems, he's a very solid first boss, probably the third best one they've done, and funnily enough, second best is the next boss on the list, so let's not waste any more time here. Finally, we get to the long-awaited Asylum Demon. The worst part is, there isn't even that much to say about the Asylum Demon. But to be fair to the big guy, this is partly why I think he is so good. As the first boss to what was most people's introductions to the Soul series, he's fairly perfect. Big dude with slow attacks, does decent damage, but not too much. And he's extremely intimidated looking, giving you that extra dopamine rush when you do take him down. Even though I don't think he's the best first boss they've made, I do think he's the best first boss they could have made for this game. Okay, so the placement for the Bella Gargoyles might be a bit misleading compared to how I actually feel about them. They are a classic example of a fight I think is genuinely really good, but I find it hard to rate any higher than this purely because it's an early game fight, making it hard for it to stand up against boss fights that are a bit later in the game. That being said, I genuinely think the Gargoyles is one of the best duo fights I've ever done. 
Starting off the fight with only one gargoyle is clever as it doesn't immediately overwhelm the player with two enemies charging them. The fact that the second one only appears after the first one drops to half HP makes it so that rushing it down is a lot more doable. Gargoyles is also a great example of a duo fight where the two bosses actually have some synergy, as one would mainly focus on melee and the other one on range attacks. This makes the fight a lot easier to control and makes overlapping attacks a lot rarer, but still requires the player to position the bosses properly to create openings. If more duo fights were done like this one, I probably wouldn't have much problem with them, but sadly they are usually just random enemies thrown together purely to make the fight harder. Though there still is one duo fight that I think is better than this one, and it's by a lot, so we'll have to wait a while until we get to them. So be sure to keep watching for, let's see, like 4 more videos and we'll be getting pretty close. Okay, it's time to get sad. Sif is very much like Gwendolyn to me. The fight itself is very unremarkable. He's a pretty basic moveset, nothing crazy, but it does do the job. Where this fight truly shines is in its lore and design. Let's get the obvious out of the way, he's a giant wolf wielding a giant sword. That's pretty fucking badass. Even if it is a really basic concept, my god does it hit. But the part that carries the fight the hardest is by far the lore. I won't be going into too much detail as this isn't a lore video, but if you're even slightly interested in this game, please look up the lore video on Sif and or Artorias. It makes this fight hit way harder. Also, if you're the type of person that leaves Sif on low HP, then I hate you. Lawrence is a bit like Parl or Dragon Slayer armor for me. He's kind of a filler boss who isn't all that memorable. The only difference is that Lawrence is a pretty major lore character. In terms of the lore, Lawrence is a very interesting character with a lot to learn about, making it all the more of a shame that his fight is so forgettable. First off, his design is very reminiscent of the Cleric Beast. For lore reasons, this does make sense, which is why I'm fine with it, but I do think it still takes away from the potential of the fight. Though the similarity doesn't really end with only the design, as the movesets are also very similar. For the first phase, Lawrence just feels like a souped up cleric beast. Where he really starts to distinguish himself is in the latter half of the fight. He'll lose his legs and start spewing lava, even leaving a trail as he crawls. This makes for a visually interesting fight, but he still feels very lacking to fight. There isn't really anything stopping you from just hugging him and spamming him down. I don't really know with Lawrence, he's such a weird fight. Promsoft just really missed hard on Lawrence in what is otherwise one of the best DLCs I've ever played. What a shame. Fire Giant is a weird one. I honestly have no idea where people stand on this one. Some people say they like it, while others despise it. Well, as you can see from the ranking, I'm pretty much somewhere in the middle. As far as fighting against giant enemies, I think Fire Giant does it pretty well. For once, the game doesn't straight up punish you for playing under them, which is the natural way to attack a giant enemy. There's a decent amount of attacks that are easy to read, with not a lot of them being extremely hard to dodge. The only thing that really drags this fight down for me is the fact that he loves to roll. For being such a big dude, he sure is agile, constantly rolling away. All this really does is extend a fight that is already pretty long, as the fire gen has a shit ton of HP. He also has one of the most brutal mid-fight cutscenes in any FromSoft game that genuinely made me feel bad for the guy for the first time I fought him. Though after roll number 352, I was feeling significantly less bad. And in comes the third contender for the worst opinion in this tier list, and this one paints me just as much as it paints you. I for the life of me tried to like this fight, but I just can't. First off, let me give you a disclaimer. I was using a great sword for my playthrough, and I honestly think a lot of the problem stems from this, but let's get into the specifics. Let's start with what is probably my biggest problem. Malekith is way too aggressive. He's basically always doing something. In his first phase, he barely has any openings. Most of his attacks will just end with him doing a backstep and swing his sword, or tossing a bunch of rocks at you. This is another major problem I have with him. He absolutely loves to create distance and just absolutely pelt you with range attacks. Something that becomes extremely tedious extremely fast. This doesn't really get any better in phase 2, where I swear he spends more time in the air than he does on the ground. Not that he's much better on the ground, as most of his moves just ends in a massive AoE around him, so you don't get that many chances to attack him then either. Don't get me wrong, I don't have a problem with waiting for openings in a boss's attack pattern, but it's just way too much with Malekith. He's just constantly doing something, basically has no downtime, doesn't flinch with any attacks no matter the weapon. He honestly might be one of the best and most fun bosses if you fight him with a faster weapon that can attack without committing much. But from my experience with the Great or Ultra Great Sword, it's one of the most frustrating fights that I've done in any of the Souls games. I genuinely think this is a massive shame, as Malekith is one of my favourite bosses in the game, design and lore wise. I tried oh so hard to like him, but I can't forgive his gameplay being so frustrating, so the least I can do is place him at the top of the OK tier. I hope you can all find any hearts to forgive me for this horrible take. Well, look at the bright side. At least that should be the last of my absolute horrendous takes. So now you just need to tank through my moderately poor takes instead. I'm sorry, Malekith. Hopefully I do you justice in the DLC. I'll be praying. Finally, we made it to the promised lands of the positive tears. 
I don't think I need to do that much explaining on how these last few tiers work, but basically, I think from here on out, it's what I consider to be a good boss fight. That doesn't mean that I think that these fights don't have flaws, because they definitely do, they just manage to transcend those flaws and end up being good fights regardless. With the good tiers specifically, there'll be several fights that might have some pretty major flaws with them, but with good movesets and presentation, they manage to still leave me satisfied thinking that was a fun fight overall, and I would not mind doing it again. With that out of the way, let's get started with the good tier. First up in the good tier, we have Lady Butterfly. Like I said in the intro to this tier, this is a good fight. It teaches you early on how to use both items and shinobi tools in order to make fights easier. But even then, the fights are more than doable without them. The main thing that drags the fight down for me is the lack of direct engagement and the utilization of ads. Let me explain. I do find this fight fun, but my main problem is that for the majority of the fight, you aren't even fighting Lady Butterfly herself. She's either jumping around on a little rope while you try to snipe her with one of your shurikens, or she's just summoning ads and peacing out while you deal with them. To be fair, both of these mechanics do have counters to them in form of shurikens and stab seats respectively, but even with these I find it to be tedious. But still, there being easily accessible counters for the annoying mechanics is more than good enough to carry the fight to the goods here, though not very far into it. Yep, absolutely no bias with this placement. Aldrich's character design had nothing to do with where I placed them in the ranking. None at all. But on a serious note, at least the amount of reason I do place Aldrich so high is both their lore and their location. Aldrich is probably the Lord of the Cinder with the most expensive but at the same time vague lore, making them one of the most interesting fights to read about. Obviously, there is also their connection to a certain other character, Kof Kof Wing Wing. The fight itself has to be a bit more hesitant though. I think this is one of the fights in the entire tier where what RNG you get will heavily influence how fun you think it is. If he is nice and ends up spamming melee attacks and his bigger beam attack, then the fight is quite fun. You get to actively fight him one on one while dodging attacks and weaving in R1s. But if you get unlucky and he's constantly teleporting and using his arrow attack, it is one of the most boring fights in Dark Souls 3. Though I would like to add that I think that the recorporation of Gundolin's attacks from his original fight was extremely well done and adds a lot to the fight if you have fought him before. Ah, we finally get to the Dark Souls 2 bosses that I actually like, and ironically enough, the first one is yet another humanoid. But at least this one has a maze. I think the number one reason that I like Velstad is that he's one of the first bosses in the entire game that doesn't feel slow. I don't know what happened between Velstad and the past humanoid bosses, but they totally nailed the pacing. He feels like the perfect speed, giving the fight the special flow that most Dark Souls 2 fights simply don't have. There are some negatives though. First are his magic attacks. While I do like that he has magic attacks to spice up his movesets, the hitboxes for his magic attacks are straight up just bad. This is especially noticeable seeing how Dark Souls 2 is usually known for having really well done hitboxes. The glancing problems really raises his ugly head in this fight. I'm honestly not sure why myself, but for some reason Velsa just hits glancing blows off the glancing blow on me the entire fight, despite it not being an issue for any other boss for a lot of hours at this point. I don't know if this is because his weapon is so big or his hitboxes in general are just bad, but it was really hard to ignore on this one. Lastly, and this one isn't all that bad, but I would have really liked to see his power up move being significantly shorter. It is almost comical how long he just kinda sits there and lets you hit him. You can easily do up to a third of his total HP during this, making what is otherwise a fairly challenging fight way too easy. That might have seemed like a lot of negatives, despite all that he still manages to climb his way into the good tier, which I think says a lot about his general gameplay and flow. If only all the human voices were this good. Well, now that we're in the goods here, we're finally going to be seeing some Bloodborne bosses again, and first up, we have the Bloodstarved Beast. To be honest, there isn't really anything that interesting about the Bloodstarved Beast. He's just yet another beast type boss. I already see plenty of these on the list. Most of the reason I rate this boss so highly is that it's Bloodborne. Bloodborne's combat just really enables this type of fight to really shine. Instead of having to be cautious and keeping your distance from beast type enemies, as they love to fly out and be unpredictable, in Bloodborne you can always be playing aggressive and in their face. On top of this, you also have the blood cocktails that you can use to distract the beast to get in some free hits, and you have a boss that really caters to every level of player. Gundu is a weird one. Initially when I think of him, it's just positive things that come to mind. But as I think more and I get reminded that phase 2 exists, my opinion kind of drops. I really do like its first phase. If I was rating him purely off of his first phase, I probably would rate him a tier higher than he currently is. But like I said, I'm just not a fan of his second phase. While I do understand that it's there to teach players about face shifts and show them that the boss of man exists, I just don't think that it's very well done. It's hard to see what he's doing, he's very wild and unpredictable, something that's quite hard for a new player to deal with. Overall, I do think that he's a good tutorial boss, I just wish that I had done his second phase a bit better. So overall, I still need to place him in low good tier, even if it pains me. The pursuit keeps up the trend of each game having a fantastic set of two first bosses. While the last giant suffered from his simple moveset, the pursuer shines despite it. 
Technically, all of his attacks are just him swinging his sword, but I still managed to make them all unique and actually fun to play against. The Pursuer is the first humanoid boss that you fight in Dark Souls 2, and honestly sets the bar really high for the best to come. This honestly might be partly to blame why so many of the humanoid bosses in Dark Souls 2 feel so lackluster. By the way, it's a boss in Dark Souls 2 who isn't humanoid, or at least not completely. Nachka is a bit of a weird one though, she's a bit of a mix between a proper fight and a gimmick fight. I say this because she does have a gimmick where she burrows into the ground, and you can lead her to collide with solid objects to stun her for a few seconds. Well, it does sound simple, and it is, but only if you know about it. It is honestly quite hard to figure out on your own, and even if you happen to do it by accident, there isn't really all that much visual feedback that implies that you have successfully done a mechanic. This is more or less of a nitpick though, overall I think Nachka is a very refreshing boss. She has quite a distinct moveset that isn't really close to any other boss in the game. She has a healthy mix of fast and slow attacks, and even some magic attacks, though these are a bit more hit or miss. There is even a mini NPC storyline revolving around her in the area, but for her that adds a fair amount to the fight even if it happened to stumble upon it. It's honestly hard to express just how nice this fight was after slugging through 8 consecutive mediocre or just straight bad fights before it. Thank you, Nachka. You truly saved my mental that day. Let me get to what I guess is the first fight of Bloodborne, and honestly, I think Bloodborne has the best two first fights of any of the games. You really get a good mix, one being a giant beast type enemy, and the other being a more standard humanoid enemy. But we'll get to the human, for now we'll talk about the beast. Cleric Beast is a pretty fantastic introduction to Bloodborne's combat system. If you decide to play it safe and keep your distance, Cleric Beast will very quickly punish you, and you will most likely die. It's only when you decide to go close and play aggressively that you'll start to see some real progress, something that gets beat into you over and over again throughout the game, but this is a pretty fantastic introduction to it. On top of that, Cleric Beast also teaches you several other mechanics, such as some enemies are weak to guns, even if you don't counter them if you shoot them in certain spots. It can also teach you that bees, surprisingly enough, aren't huge fans of fire, so using molotovs against them is pretty effective. And honestly, I can go on. Cleric Beast teaches you a lot of different things depending on how you approach him. No wonder Bloodborne is the best one in the series. No bias though, of course. Quailag is some of the best Dark Souls 1 has to offer. It is a perfectly balanced between great storytelling and a fantastic fight. Like with all other bosses, I won't really be going into the lore, but I would heavily recommend that you do if you aren't familiar. I'm just going to say that it is fantastic. As far as the fight goes, it's also fantastic. Quelleg's special mechanic is crowd control, which she does by spewing lava on the ground, forcing you away from certain points in the boss room, and controlling your movements to some extent. On top of this, she has a very solid moveset that has a good mix of slower and readable attacks, and ones that you learn as you go. Quelleg acts as a checkpoint from the easier early game, as she has a significant increase in difficulty from what comes before her, it only gets harder after this. There's no wonder that she's a fan favourite, and very much deserve her spot in the good tier. Alamar is what I previously referred to as a filler boss, though when it comes to Elden Ring, it's a bit harder to refer to them as that. It's quite a unique moveset for just being some random dude you can meet in the overworld. I do admit I like it when they do have humanoid enemies with sword, but with a twist that spices them up a bit, and Elamar's weird spinny sword definitely does that. This moveset is quite solid, pretty much up to par with the rest of the game's high average quality. Only complaint I really have for him is that he's a bit too simple. He doesn't have enough moves or HP, making his fight pretty short. It would be cool to see a powered up version of him with more moves in the future. Here's hoping the DLC delivers. Vort, much like the rest of the second bosses in the series, is a banger. There isn't even really anything that special about him. He does have his rush phase, which isn't used all that often for humanoid enemies like him. There's just something about him as a whole that's just fun to fight. It's just one of those fights where it flows perfectly and you just have fun. I feel like most veterans I've fought him before just kind of get what I mean. Even though there's obviously still a long way to the top, there isn't anything I would change about Vort. He's perfect for the stage of the game he's in, and that's fine. Not every boss needs to be some S-tier boss, though Vort is S-tier in my heart. Paro is in many ways the same as the Bloodstar Beast. Maybe not literally, but both are beast-type enemies that don't really have any obvious flaws in their movesets. Paro flows really well, and is for the most part a fun fight. Where he falls a bit short is that he's pretty forgettable. It might not be something that you're necessarily thinking about as you're fighting him at the time, but as time goes on and you fight more bosses, you'll start to see where he falls a bit short. One of these things is his unique aspect being his lightning moves, that doesn't really affect the fight all that much, and you might not even remember that he has lightning moves at all if it's been a while. That's if you remember him at all, really. Though I'm ragging on the poor boy a lot, the reason why I rate him so high is that the time of fighting, he's challenging but fun, even if your members of him don't age that well. Personally, I find Vicar Mila to be too bloodborne than what Quayle like is to Dark Souls 1. She acts as a checkpoint that divides the early game and the mid game, though Vicar Amelia might be a bit more obvious as the world literally changes when you beat her. Gameplay wise, I find her to be sort of the culmination of all the beast fights that you have fought so far. 
She's the ultimate test for you as a hunter to make sure that you're ready for the night that is to come. I don't really have anything negative about the fight. The only thing I can think of is that she maybe has a bit too much HP, and I wouldn't mind if it was slightly lower, or maybe a bit more damage to compensate. Calamite might be the boss that benefited the most from me replaying the entire series for this video. Before I played Dark Souls 1 again, I genuinely hated Calamite, and I would actively avoid fighting him whenever I did additional playthroughs. But after forcing myself to fight him this time, since I needed some footage, my opinion of him skyrocketed. First, the lead up to his fight is some of the best in the series, meeting him on the bridge and then later on in his arena where he just cooks you. But the cutscene where Go shoots him down? Cinematic masterpiece. Fight wise, I think he's the best dragon Fonsoft has ever made. He still has a lot of the same bullshit as a lot of other dragons have, like the charge attack with no tell and constant micro stutters around his legs. There's just something about Kalami. He just feels more intelligent than the other dragons you fight. Most other dragons still feel like you're fighting an animal. They are wild and they thrash around a bunch, but Kalamid is more of a humanoid fight, but in dragon form, if that makes any sense. It's probably not. Basically, except for those two examples earlier, I don't think there are any problems with Kalamid's moveset. He's just straight up a good and enjoyable fight. Even though you might have struggled with him in the past, I urge you to go back and give him another try. It might just be because I play more Souls games afterwards that he feels this way. I'd be interested to hear if any of you can relate to this. Next up, we have the Forgotten Child of Dark Souls 3 DLC, and honestly, I think it's a bit of a shame. Champion Gravetender and Champion Wolf is another really solid duo fight, and yet again, it's because you don't actually have to deal with both of them at the same time for all that long. Much like Gargoyles, the second boss doesn't appear before you get the first boss to half HP. Thing is, the first boss in this fight is an NPC boss, meaning that stun knocking them and rushing them down is very simple. He does come with two smaller wolves to help him out a bit, but you can easily bait them out and then just one-shot them. The reason why I don't really mind that he's easy to kill fast is that the fight doesn't really start until the wolf appears anyways. The wolf genuinely has one of the most fun moves as in the entire game to play against. You're both constantly weaving in and out, trading blows and dodging. Normally I'd find bosses that rush away from you boring as you have to wait, or sprint off of them until you can do anything, but that isn't a problem in this fight, as the wolf would always rush right back to you. The fight might be mechanically simple and have little to no lore, but at the very least I thoroughly enjoyed fighting them. Which is honestly not something I can say about half the fights on this list. Shadows of Yarmin is one of the best fights with more than two enemies in the entire game. As for previous fights, I think a lot of this comes from the combat in Bloodborne. Its more aggressive and faster paced combat makes it much easier to weave in and out to find openings against multiple enemies. The enemies themselves are also really well balanced and is one of the few fights where they were very obviously designed with each other in mind. They are all unique, making it so they play around each other really well. They don't tend to overlap attacks all that often. They are also different in playstyle, making it easier to focus down one specific one, no matter which are alive. There are even mechanics where you kill a few that makes the fight harder to compensate, giving the fight a really nice difficulty curve. I really wish that this was the standard that FromSoft always had for multi-fights, but other than one single fight that is a bit further up the list, I don't think they've ever really reached this quality again. Just like the previous fight, this is another fight that I think is carried quite a bit by the game it's in. I think that overall, Dragon's Lair armor is pretty comparable to a lot of bosses in Dark Souls 2. His moveset is overall very slow and easy to read, but punishing when you do get hit. He has an add mechanic that just doesn't really matter as you can for the most part just ignore it. And most obviously, he's yet another humanoid, though at least his weapon is pretty unique. All this adds up to what I would consider a fairly bog standard fight, but what carries it and makes it better than all the fights below it is that it's in Dark Souls 3. As the last game in the Souls trilogy, it has by far the most polished combat system out of the three. This makes fighting what are otherwise pretty standard bosses feel much more satisfying. Because of this, I can't really put the fight with the others that I think are technically pretty comparable. Maybe in the future, whenever Dark Souls 1 and 2 get remakes, and I inevitably have to do a redo of this entire video. This is probably another fight that I rate higher than the average. I'm not even 100% sure myself why I like this fight as much as I do. Just one of those fights that I think has a really good flow to it. There aren't really any attacks that I think are problematic or annoying to play against. Her special mechanic where she darkens the arena and starts walking slowly towards you while flailing all her limbs is stressful and takes a bit of getting used to, but it's fun to play against and it looks pretty cool. Overall, I think it's just a well done fight with not a lot of flaws and a pretty good flow. Maybe I'll change my mind whenever Sony found the decides to remake Bloodborne. I guess we'll see. Renella is probably the best caster fight that FromSoft has ever done, something that they have struggled with in the past. She has two very different faces that play completely different to one another, both of these being improved versions of previous fights in the series. Her first face is mostly just a gimmick fight, we have to kill specific adds that are singing in order to make Renala vulnerable. Think Deacons of the Deep, but not shit. 
I think that the singing aspect adds a lot to the fight, in both atmosphere and gameplay, as you can use the singing to locate where the ad is. When you empty her health bar in phase 1, you're transported to probably one of the most stunning boss arenas in any FromSoft game. This is where I think the fight turns into a better version of Alana. Much like Alana, Renala is another spellcaster who will try to keep a distance from you while spawning ads for you to deal with. Where the two differs are Renala has a much more interesting arsenal of both ads and spells that she can use throughout the fight. She has a total of 4 ads that she can spawn, instead of just 2. She will also despawn and respawn her ads much more frequently than Alana. All this makes the fight way less frustrating. Gameplay wise, I still don't think this is the best that FromSoft can do with a caster fight, as it's still very much carried by other factors such as character design and the arena, but it is a pretty major step up from the previous ones. Darkwalker is such a weird boss. It's really hard to get to, where you have to complete a long ass quest line to even get to attempt the fight. And it's honestly a shame since it's one of the most unique and fun fights in the entire game. The best fight in the game if you don't count any DLC. At first, you'd think that I would hate the Dark Lurker. He's a caster and a duo fight. Well, the easiest way to explain why I think it is a good fight would be to explain its main mechanic. Basically, when you get Dark Lurker to about half HP, he'll split himself into two. From here, the fight drastically changes as you have to deal with two of them instead. This is another example of a fight where you have to fight several enemies that were very obviously designed with each other in mind, as they have several attacks that directly involve both. For example, they'll sometimes shoot attacks at each other where the receiving Dark Lurker will create a portal and redirect the attack towards you, so you have to figure out where the attack will eventually come from. There is a lot to keep in mind during this fight, but it never gets to the point where it's frustrating. It's honestly a shame that this fight is as hidden as it is, and that it's in Dark Souls 2. If it was done in Dark Souls 3 and given the attention that I think it deserves, I think it could be one of the best fights in the entire series. As it stands, it's a really good concept, but they simply just don't do enough with it for it to be any higher on the list than it is. But it's still a really good fight that I enjoyed a lot. Arbutus is for the most part a very well done big boss. She's a very moveset but she'll use most of her limbs to attack. She's for the most part slow, but she has some faster attacks weaved in there to keep you paying attention. What she starts to feel lacking is that she suffers from the same thing a lot of bigger bosses do. Even though it feels like the fight is designed around being in front of her, it's actually the worst place to be. By simply hugging her side, you'll just kinda end up dodging a lot of her attacks without really doing anything. I do feel like a lot of new players don't know about this, so they don't actually do it, and if you self-impose a role not to do this in the fight, it's actually a pretty challenging one. Obviously, it is a flaw with the fight, but it's at least that one that you have to choose to exploit, so I won't hold it against it too much. So other than this, I find it to be one of the most enjoyable fights against larger monsters. The design also helps with this as she's one of the most unique designs in the series. Truly looking like something straight out of a Lovecraft book, and I'm all for it. While I think that Renala is one of the best caster fights they've done, I think that Loretta is the absolute best one. Loretta is a unique boss. Not only that she's a caster boss, but she's also one of the few mounted bosses. The decision to give her a mount was honestly pretty genius. Most of the time, FromSoft's solution to caster bosses was just to simply give them a beefy frontline, like Velstop for Alana or the Spirit Summons for Renala. Though they didn't need that for Loretta, as she has her horse. This both makes her a lot tankier than the previous bosses and gives her the ability to keep a distance. Despite this, she doesn't run away all that often. She'll sometimes create distance, but this doesn't take long for you to close. Red has a good combination of melee and ranged magic attacks that she uses against you, which I think is another crucial part of why she works as well as she does. While most other caster bosses are primarily only ranged, but I can actually go toe to toe with you even in melee range. None of her attacks are annoying to deal with, and it all culminates in a good moveset that has good flow to it. Loretta was honestly one of the most surprising fights in the game, as I didn't expect it to be anywhere near as fun as it ended up being. The only real complaint I have about the fight is that it isn't really all that hard. I feel like most probably probably beat her on the first or second try. With a bit more oomph to her, I think she could have climbed a bit more, but I'm still very satisfied with what we got. Moon Presence is another weird one. Overall, I think Moon Presence is a good fight, but I still find it to be a disappointing fight, so let me explain. If you didn't know, Moon Presence is the hidden final boss of Bloodborne. By doing a bunch of random stuff in the game, you can unlock this extra fight after what is technically the last boss. The main reason I'm disappointed with this fight is that it's just a worse fight than the actual original final boss. I wouldn't really go into much depth about that boss as he's a bit high on the list. Though I do say that I find Moon Presence disappointing, I still think it's a good fight. Moon Presence is technically a larger boss, but because of his thin body, he doesn't really feel like one. His moveset is overall fine, with no obvious bad attacks. He does have a unique mechanic that falls a bit flat. He'll every now and then do a scream that will put you to 1 HP. On paper, it sounds like a decent mechanic, but the problem is that it's way too easy to deal with. After he does the scream, he's done for several seconds, so all you have to do is just walk up to him and hit him a few times, and he'll get most of, if not all of your HP back, and get to do a bunch of damage to the boss at the same time. 
Somehow the attack where you put you to 1 HP is the one that you want to get more often as it's just free damage for you. I think with some added mechanics it could be a cool attack but as it stands it's just not very good. The greatest strength of the Moon Presence is definitely his design. He looks really cool and unlike anything else in the game. This coupled with his opening cutscene and animation, he's quite the intimidating boss. I only wish that his fight reflected this more. This is specifically for the first time you fight Al. This doesn't take into account the second fight at all. Al is a very peculiar fight. He's one of the only bosses in the entire series that will actually fight dirty. Usually Souls fights are very centered on everything being fair and balanced, and is a lot of the reason why the Souls series is as beloved as it is. But Al breaks that. He will at several times in the battle fight dirty. Sometimes he'll pretend to surrender and attack you, or use smoke to obscure where he is, and sometimes he'll even completely stop you from healing. I think this is a really interesting concept, and my only complaint is that I don't think they went far enough with it. I think this is one of those fights where they could have done some more meta things to trick the player. Maybe have him pretend to be hurt and show his health bar as lower than it actually is, or maybe give him some of the same tools that the player has. I do understand there's a very thin line between cool and enjoyable and just straight up frustrating mechanics when it comes to this type of thing. But with Souls of All Things, I don't think I would have minded added mechanics that are a bit frustrating. Other than this, Al has a varied and interesting moveset. His sourcings are slow but punishing, and with the mix of previously mentioned tricks he plays, he ends up being one of the most memorable fights in the entire game. If I were to criticize it in any way, it would be my usual one that the boss simply being too easy. I beat him on my first try on my first playthrough, which I thought was a bit of a shame. Though I suppose this might be because he does have a hard fight later on. You might remember roughly 10 hours early in the video that I mentioned there was a better version of the Orm fight, and this is it. Rikard is essentially the same type of gaming fight as Yorm, just done much better. In the Rikard fight, the special weapon you use is right in front of you as you pass through the fog gate, instead of just being at the opposite end of the room. For the Rikai fight, all of the attacks are unique instead of just the weapon art, giving you a lot more freedom in the fight. This also makes the fight feel a lot more standard from FromSoft instead of just a gimmick. By giving you a full weapon instead of just a weapon art, they also had the option to fully flesh out the boss, which they definitely did with Rikai. Yorm for the most part only had 2 or 3 attacks that we would use against you. Meanwhile, Rikai has 2 phases, both with their own unique moveset. I honestly don't have much to say about the first phase. It's a fairly easy stage and I feel like it's mostly just there to get you used to your new weapon and what it can do. But the fight really gets interesting is when you get phase 2 and Rakar fully reveals himself. Instead of just fighting a snake, you're now fighting a giant boss with a sword. This also gives him a completely new moveset for you to learn, while still borrowing a few attacks from phase 1. Phase 2 is also where most of my complaints about the fight come from. While I think that Rikard is overall a good fight, there are quite a few problems with the second phase. Firstly, he really likes to move towards you. This isn't really that much of a problem until he matches it back into a corner. You wouldn't think this would happen all that often with how big his arena is, but it happened to me almost every single time I fought him. This could have easily been fixed by simply making the arena bigger, and I don't really see a reason why they didn't just do this. Secondly, towards the end of his second phase, the fight really devolves into a complete shitshow. There's a bunch of different spells that have lingering effects and last for a while. This comes with the fact that he starts to rain down about a million meteors and there isn't really a single person on this planet that can tell what is actually going on. Your best bet for when this happens is just spam dodge and pray that you don't die. This can make the fight pretty frustrating overall as it just feels like it's out of your control and the only reason I don't really mind it that much myself is that it's a great spectacle. This fits in quite well with the fact that it's a gimmick fight and therefore isn't really meant to be much like other fights in the series. If they turned down how much of a shit show his second face is, I think Rikard is the best gimmick fight and one of the best spectacle fights in the entire series. Now, if you've ever done a soul level 1 run of Dark Souls 3, then you can probably just skip out this entire entry as you'll disagree with this placement quite a bit. But seeing how I have never done a soul level 1 run myself, I actually really like this fight. To explain this to people that don't know, I'll have to get into his movesets, so let's start. Osiris has two faces. They start off very passive with a lot of slow moves. This is because he's holding Ocelot, his son, in his arm as he fights. He will also constantly be talking to Ocelot throughout the fight. There isn't really much to say about his first phase. It's just a mediocre fight. Where the real fun starts is when you get to him to half health. He will get very frustrated and slam Ocelot into the ground, supposedly killing him. For the rest of the fight, Osiris is now enraged. All his attacks have become a lot more feral and unpredictable. He starts doing a lot more standard dragon attacks like breath attacks and charges. And this is where all the people have done soul level 1 runs will get PTSD. See, Osiris has this standard dragon rush, and like with most other dragons, he doesn't have a startup animation. This honestly isn't that much of a problem in normal playthroughs, as you can easily tank through the damage, but if you're doing a solo one run, you simply don't have the HP to tank it, and he'll just one shot you. Other than this though, I don't really have any problems with the moveset at all. It's generally very fast, and has a very good flow to it. 
Osiris is honestly just a boss to fight. Despite not being all that hard, he is still one of the most fun fights in the entire game. Some part of me wishes they had some sort of third phase to make up for him losing so much HP during the first phase. Without it, he just ends up being a bit too easy as you get to chunk him to pretty much half for free. With some sort of healing mechanic or a phase 3, he'd probably move up an entire tier. But as it stands, he's sitting comfortably at the top of the good tier. Asil is one of those rare big bosses where standing in front of him is actually the best way of fighting him, and that's probably my favourite part about him. Asil has a pretty smart design, but they mix in big AoE attacks that go around his entire body. This pretty much forces you to play in front of him to give you enough time to actually make it away in time. This on top of the fact that you will reduce damage to anywhere that is in his head is enough to where you won't really want to fight him anywhere else. The rest of his moveset is also good with no bad or frustrating attacks to deal with. So I might not like the fact that he's occasionally teleporting away from you, but I think this is done quite well this time. He never teleports all that far away and you can always see exactly where he's going to appear so you get a bit of a head start. He'll also shoot and whip his tail at you while you run so it's not like it's complete idle time. The biggest fault with this fight is that I think it's a massive shame that they decided to add another Vastel fight later on in some random dungeon. I think this lessens the impact of this fight and makes it feel less unique, though I guess this is more of a problem with Elden Ring in general. True Corrupt and Monk is another one of those fights that doesn't really do one specific thing well, it's just overall a really solid fight. It has a strong sense of identity as his animation and lore fits really well. It has smooth methodical movements, very fitting of a monk. True Corrupt and Monk is honestly quite hard to rank. If you fight it normally, it's a decently hard fight as it has 3 phases. It's overall a lot of health to go through, even if none of the phases on their own are particularly hard. The thing is, if you know the fight, it's one of the easiest in the entire game. There are just too many ways you can cheese the fight. Well, I call it cheese, but it is fully intended by the devs that you can do it. For example, you can completely skip the second phase by going on the branch on top of the boss and doing a plunging attack, something that isn't very hard to figure out on your own. There's also the questionable choice that you fight another monk literally right before this one. Now, it's not unusual for Amsov to put a weaker version of a late game boss early in the game, but they don't usually put it right before it. It would have been fine if this was used as the first phase of the fight, but no, it's an entire other fight and subtracts from the one that precedes it. It's just such a shame that so many random decisions take away from what is otherwise a very well done fight. And finally we make it to the end of Gids here. Now obviously, my entire list is biased, but this placement is more so than the others. I don't actually think that Gwyn's fight is that good, it has a lot of problems. Like the fact that he's way too squishy, or the way he's way too aggressive make it so you have to exploit the AI to even get a heal in. His moveset also has his own problems, like how it's way too easy to parry, or that he has one specific attack that's way too fast and isn't even reasonable to expect the player to dodge. Despite all this, I really like Gwyn's fight. It's a fight that is helped greatly by factors outside of his actual fight. First there's lore. You get to hear a lot about Gwyn throughout the game. He is this massive figure in the lore, pretty much the god of Lordran. He's built up so much throughout the game, but when you finally get to meet him, he's this burned up husk of himself. He's not the man he used to be, just mindlessly attacking you on sight. This is perfectly reflected in his design, really showing you just how much he has fallen and given up for the sake of the Age of Fire. Even if you disagree with the King of the Fire, you understand where he's coming from and you can't help but respect the man for his effort. And there's obviously his music, probably the best track in the entire game. I genuinely get goosebumps whenever I hear it. No matter how disappointing the actual fight is, I think I'd love this fight because of the foundation prompts off this lane. Easily one of my favourite last bosses in any game ever. Man, what a banger. Moving on to the very good tier, and honestly there isn't that much to explain about this one. Very good is where I think the truly amazing fights start. All of them will have flaws, but managers be very enjoyable despite them. From here on out, I'll consider every fight to be among the best in any game. It's just that FromSoft's average is so high that there's still two more tiers after this one. So let's kick off the very good tier with... Margaret is what I consider to be the best first boss FromSoft has ever made. Many people probably disagree with me and not even count him as the first boss as technically you can, and probably will, fight several bosses before him. Personally, I do consider him to be the first boss as he's the first proper boss that a majority of players will fight, as the game immediately pressures you to head to Stonevale Castle after leaving the catacombs. I do think that you are technically meant to go to the Weeping Peninsula first, as the enemies there are easier and there isn't much point to go there after the castle. That out of the way, let's get to the fight itself. 
The main reason I consider Mago to be the best first fight is that he does the best job of preparing you for what the rest of the game is going to be like. His moveset reflects how most other enemies are going to fight, being a mix between melee and ranged, and fast and slow. He also has several combos that have unique timing, but this will mean he will often break the pace of the fight to charge an attack. In previous Souls game, most of the fights followed a certain rhythm, making it so that even if you hadn't seen an attack before, you could very reliably guess roughly about when the attack would happen. Market breaks this tradition by having several attacks in which the charge up will linger for what feels like an uncomfortable amount of time. This tends to catch a lot of veteran players off guard, forcing them to pay more attention to the specific moves and having to learn them individually, instead of just learning the general rhythm. I also find this to be an interesting mechanic regardless of being new or a returning player, as the time during which the attack is being charged creates this weird tension in you, making you almost want to yell at him to just swing already. It's almost akin to walking down a dimly lit corridor in a horror game where you just know there's going to be a jump scare, making you tense up in anticipation the entire way through. This sort of attack will also be used later on in the game, so giving it to Margaret is a great way of letting both old and new players know about this shift in design. Margaret also has a face change in the middle of his fight, without there being a break. Personally, I love it when FromSoft does this. It keeps the flow of the fight while still mixing it up by giving bosses some more moves. Margaret does this very well. Getting some new moves while also keeping his old so you don't get overwhelmed. This might be a bit more controversial, but I like Margaret's mechanic where he will input read and do a ranged attack if you drink. This punishes the player if they try to drink when the boss is ready to react. I think most people have a strong reaction to this because they're used to bosses just letting them do whatever they want in previous Souls games. This change makes it so you actually have to create a situation yourself where you can heal, something that is way more rewarding and makes much more sense. I do think he does have some problems though. Since I've played every modern Souls game before, I personally don't find him that hard, but I do think he's a bit too hard for casual players, and even some experienced ones. This might have been done to teach you that if a boss is too hard then you should explore the open world and become stronger first, but if this is the case, I think they could have done a much better job at conveying this to the player. The first thing that is told you after you escape the tomb is that you should head to the castle by both Vare and Melina. Even after you die to Margit, there isn't anything that tells you, or even as much as implies, that maybe you should go and explore outside more. This is partly why I find it so confusing that they send you to Stormvale Castle right away, when they could point you towards the Weeping Peninsula instead. He does also have some attacks that I don't like, mostly his dagger attacks. It feels a bit arbitrary when in combos he decides to pull it out, making it hard to play around, but it doesn't do all that much damage, it doesn't end up affecting the fight all that much. So overall, I think Margaret is a fantastic boss. He does an amazing job at teaching both new and veteran players what to expect for the rest of the game. I think he gets a lot of flack from certain players because he's the first boss to implement several new mechanics. I probably would have put him in a higher position if it weren't for the fact that he has another fight later on. Out of all the fights in this series, this is the one that feels the most like an actual jewel. It's honestly hard to explain why Sir Alon's fight is as good as it is if you haven't tried to yourself. Best way I can explain it, as I have with several other fights, is that the fight just has a really good flow to it. You aren't really thinking about too many other things, just looking at your opponent and reacting. None of his attacks are bullshit, there's no extra unique mechanic, it's just a duel between you and a boss with a moveset that is genuinely fun to play against. This being said, he does have some flaws. The biggest one is his godforsaken runback. Getting to the boss is one of the worst experiences I had in Dark Souls 2. Not only is it long, it has about a million enemies lined up between you and the boss, several of which being ranged. It's honestly rare that you manage to make it to the boss without taking any damage at all. You should have just been put right in front of the boss as you go into the enemy. It's actually beyond me why they didn't do this. The second thing has nothing to do with the fight really, and it's just a Dark Souls 2 problem in general. And that is that you'll get clipped. A lot. Even if you manage to dodge attacks perfectly, he'll still chip away at your HP. This doesn't really matter that much as the fight isn't hard enough to where the chip damage really matters. Where it does matter is when he does it with his grab. Instead of doing chip damage, he'll just straight up grab you. And like this isn't bad enough, his grab attack also has an extra mechanic where it powers him up. So if you're unlucky, the game can really fuck you over. Sir Alon is one of the few fights in Dark Souls 2 that I genuinely enjoyed. Thank god for the DLCs. This is where we pass to the threshold into bosses that I think are actually quite difficult. Dancer is a very unique boss, because even though she technically is a humanoid with swords, she is probably one of the most unique movesets in the entire franchise. Most of her moves are slow yet graceful, very befitting of her name. She doesn't have any attacks that I consider bad, I think it's the opposite. I think every move she has is interesting and fun to play against. This makes for a boss that has what I've been calling so far a very good flow. There's never a dull moment as long as you engage with the boss, it's a constant dance where you're dodging and attacking. Dancer also has the added bonus of having a really interesting visual design. 
From her actual model to her weapons, she's one of the most interesting looking humanoid bosses that FromSoft has produced. I've even had an entire playthrough where I used her armor and weapons, though admittedly her weapons do kinda suck. The only real criticism I can muster is that your first time fighting her can be frustrating, as you teleport straight into her fight after killing the last Lord of Cinder, excluding the Twin Princes of course. This will result in you dropping all your souls in her boss room as you will most likely die to her in your first attempt. You can just simply retrieve them by picking them up and homeward boarding out of there, but that's obviously not ideal. Contrary to most bosses this high on the list, I actually have caught a lot of problems with Pontiff, yet still, I do think he is a great boss. So let me first explain the problems I have with him, and then I'll get into why I still think he's fantastic. One of the most obvious problems is with his attacks themselves. Pontiff has a very varied moveset, with a pretty even split between fast and slow attacks, though most of our problems do come from his fast ones. As I mentioned with some other bosses on the list, some of Pontiff's attack are simply way too fast. To save myself the trouble of having to measure it myself, I'm just going to use Joseph Anderson's video as my proof. I'm not going to just rip a section of his video, so I highly encourage you to click the timestamp link in the description to get a more fleshed out explanation of this topic. But to summarize the parts that are relevant to my point, some of Pontiff's attack are unreasonably fast. Anderson measures that the average needed frames for a person to be able to react to an attack is around 15. Pontiff has at least two attacks whose windups are faster than 15 frames, these being this stab attack and this overhead slash. To further compound these issues, both of these attacks share their windup animation with other moves that are much slower, creating a problem where you have to dodge immediately, assuming that he's going to use his fast attack. If he does not use this attack, but the slower version, you will now be guaranteed to get hit. This is a pretty big problem when the entire Soul franchise is built on being hard, but fair. The next point is a bit more of a subjective one, but since this is my list video, I think it's appropriate for me to include it anyways. When you get Pontiff to about half HP, he will enter a second phase where he spawns a clone of himself. As discussed with Dark Lurker, creating a clone can be an interesting addition to a fight, but with Pontiff, I don't think it quite hit the mark. While Dark Lurker's clone will interact with the main body, creating unique combos and patterns, Pontiff's clone is a lot more boring. All the clone does is the exact same move as the main body, with that slight delay. All this achieves is making the fight more frustrating as it heavily limits or just straight up removes any openings you have to counterattack. Personally, I don't think it adds any depth to the fight, and my usual solution is just to tank through attacks right when he is spawned to rush down the clone and continue the fight as a 1v1. So those are some pretty major flaws for a fight that I rate to be very good, and to be frank, it's hard to really justify this bot. Like many bosses before it, much of it comes down to the flow of the fight. Even despite the major flaws to his moveset, Pontiff is a lot of fun to fight. His difficulty, even despite his problems, is a major factor for his placement. Even though I think Dark Souls 3 is one of, if not outright, the best game of the series, it doesn't have a whole lot of hard fights. The DLCs do rectify this to a certain extent, but I do think the base game is a bit lackluster. There's only 4 fights that I would really consider to be actually challenging, with Pontiff being the hardest out of these. Difficulty on its own obviously doesn't carry a fight, cough cough mid ear, but Dark Souls 3 desperately needed some harder fights to bolster his arsenal, and Pontiff just so happened to be what the game needed, even despite his flaws. Modern Lugarius is a rare one. As you start the fight, he's mostly a caster. He does have his sight that he'll occasionally use to swipe at you, but for the most part he'll be using his magic attacks. To be honest, I don't think he's particularly fun to fight during this phase. Most of his magic attacks are just to create space between you and the boss, making the fight a bit tedious and slow. But once you manage to whittle him down to around 75%, the entire fight shifts. Lugarius goes from this slow spellcaster to a very aggressive melee enemy. He draws his short sword and doesn't really use any of our spells for the rest of the fight. Instead he starts running you down. He's either constantly rushing at you or already in your face swiping at you with the sword. His moveset is a bit limited, but he does make up for it with his aggression. He's the type of boss that I think would only work in Bloodborne's fast-paced combat system. As far as flaws go, I honestly don't have that many, other than the start of the fight of course. Once you get him to his second phase, he's just a really enjoyable fight. One of the first proper hard bosses in the game, at least he was for me. Morgoth is very much like Pontiff for me. While I do rate the fight fairly highly, I do also have a bunch of problems with it. But the problems I have with these fights are very different. With Morgoth, most of my problems come from just how exhausting he is to fight against. What I mean by this is that there honestly just aren't all that many openings against him. He will very often launch into combos that are 7 or even 8 attacks long, just to end them by jumping away, making it so that you either get one light attack in, or just none at all. 
You will then proceed to rush in again and just release another barrage at you, Rinse repeat. The norm before Elden Ring was that the bosses will often use slower individual attacks with sporadic combos every now and then. Morgoth isn't like this. Almost all of his attacks are combos. This is what I mean by exhausting. You will on average roll 4-5 to five times for every one hit you get on him. This might sound a bit hypocritical as I just praised Logarius for being aggressive, but the big difference between these two fights is that one is in Elden Ring and the other one is in Bloodborne. Everything about Bloodborne's combat system is designed with speed and aggression in mind. While not slow, Elden Ring's combat is at least slower. It simply doesn't allow for the same fast-paced movement that is required for fights like this. Another problem I have with this fight is actually one that he shares with Pontiff. A lot of his attacks are simply way too similar. This ends up having the same effect as it does with Pontiff, where there simply isn't any way for you to know exactly what attack is going to come next, ending up with you taking a lot of cheap hits. In the same vein, Morgoth has this unique mechanic where he would just straight up change what attack he will do in a combo. Instead of all of his combos being predetermined, it feels as though he has a pool of attacks that he will string together in a random order. This could honestly be an interesting mechanic for a fight, but I simply find Morgoth to be way too fast and complex for this sort of system to be tested. Maybe if they try again in the DLC or eventual sequel with a boss that is much slower, I think they could probably make it work. Just like with Pontiff, my reasoning is basically the same. I rate Morgoth highly because despite all of these faults, I do think he's a very fun fight. You also meet him around the same time as you do with Pontiff in Dark Souls 3, where you feel a pretty massive spike in difficulty as you transition into what I consider to be the late game of the respective games. I think both of these bosses are perfectly placed, something that does a lot of heavy lifting with my enjoyment of their fights. A lot of bosses, like Pontiff and Morgoth, have two main ways of attacking. A main weapon that is slow yet punishing, and one smaller one that is fast but does less damage. Usually the trap that these bosses fall in is that they will make the small weapon way too fast, as we've discussed previously. While the Abyss Watchers do also use a greatsword dagger combo, where they differ is that their dagger moves are finally done right. Their attacks are never too fast, and they don't have an over-reliance on them like others tend to have. To further add to this, Abyss Watchers also do a fantastic job of comboing their weapons. Instead of just having two distinct weapons, they feel as one, wherein several of the attacks they will use the dagger in some indirect way to complement their sword attacks, like in the rush attack wherein they'll use the dagger as a sort of break by stabbing it into the ground. To complement the multiple weapons, there are also multiple Abyss Watchers. While this is a mechanic that I usually don't like, I find this to be the exception to the rule. The way it works is that there are three Abyss Watchers in the fight. One acts as the main boss and therefore is the health bar for the fight, the second is a pure add and has their own HP pool, and the third is a wild card, he's corrupted and can attack anyone in the arena. This third enemy is mostly why I think this fight works. Instead of having to fight well outnumbered, you have a wild card in the mix that can both tank and do damage for you. While this could make the fight too easy, he's also able to damage you, making so you still have to play around him to some extent. You do also get some satisfaction from manipulating his AI in such a way that he does exactly what you want from him. Bisswasher also does my favourite thing that a multi-enemy boss fight can do, it has a second phase which is a pure one-on-one -on -one fight between you and the boss. The way the Abyss Watchers do this is when you fully drain the first health bar, you get a short cutscene that shows you the main enemy you have been fighting powering up. You will then completely fill his health bar back up and you have to fight him again. The difference is that now he's alone and has several new moves and also an added fire mechanic to both his old and new moves. The fire mechanic is very obviously borrowed from another boss that they've made, though we haven't made it to our tier quite yet. The second phase fight is superb. He still has a good balance between fast and slow attacks I talked about earlier. Bisswatches is one of those fights where the boss just doesn't have any bad moves. All his moves are well balanced and fun to play against, making it flow really well. His difficulty is also balanced perfectly for when you fight the boss, making him challenging but not too difficult. Abyss Watchers is one of the best intermediate bosses FromSoft has ever made and very much deserves his spot on the list. Hume Knight is another one of those fights where he's in general a pretty fantastic fight, he's just being held back by a few pretty major flaws. This being said, I want you to understand that even though this segment will mostly be about his flaws, I think Fume Knight is overall a very good fight, and if it weren't for these flaws he'd probably be an entire tier above his current standing. Let's get the most obvious thing out of the way. Fume Knight is a Dark Souls 2 boss. Obviously, I'm not going to just shit on the fight purely for being in Dark Souls 2, but it does come with some baggage. The biggest thing being the clipping issue. Many of Fume Knight's faster attacks will end up clipping you and doing chip damage even if you are mid-roll. This is a problem with most bosses in Dark Souls 2, and sadly, Fume Knight is no exception. 
That being said, it fortunately isn't as big of a problem with Fumonitis as with some other fights. Next up, the healing aspect. To refresh your memory, as it has been a while since Dark Souls 2 released, around the arena there are several statues that emit an aura that will heal the boss if he gets close to them. Usually I'm a fan of mechanics that affect the fire from outside the arena, but this one just didn't quite hit the mark. On its own, the healing isn't really a problem, it's what you have to do to get rid of them that I have taken issue with. You need to get these rods that you get from exploring the DLC. The problem is, getting all of them is pretty tedious. Some of them are hidden in places that you don't really want to explore and are really easy to miss. Luckily, these statues don't have that much of an effect on the fight. Even if you do the bare minimum of exploring, you still end up with enough rods to at least clear one half of the arena. From here, it's really easy to just pull the boss to that side, never really having to worry about the mechanic at all. Last point is a bit of a petty one, but it's one I want to talk about. As I mentioned previously with Velstat, some bosses in this game have attacks in the form of balls that they will shoot out. I don't know whether I'm wrong, as FromSofts are usually really good at hitboxes, but these balls are some of the worst hitboxes I've ever seen. I will try to get some examples on screen, but these balls will actually hit you no matter where you're standing. This is the only attack I have problem with this entire kit, but I, I, I needed to vent. And finally, we get to why I would consider it to be the best dragon fight in the entire series. Placidra Sanks is not only the best dragon fight in the series, but it's somehow one of my favorites altogether. I honestly think that the number one thing that Placidra Sanks does better than any other dragon fight is that it's actually unique. It's not like every other dragon fight where it has pretty much the exact same form, so the fight just devolves into running under it and hitting one of its back legs. Not only does it have a completely different form from other dragons, it also has a completely different moveset. This makes it so he doesn't have any of those really annoying moves that most dragons have. He instead replaces them with actual decent moves that aren't frustrating to play against. He does have a lot of moves where it requires you to run away from him, and while I have criticized some other bosses for this, I think that Placidious X more than makes up for it by having a lot of downtime where you can get plenty of hits in. This is amped up quite a bit once you get into about half HP. Here Placidious X will start to do a lot of attacks in a row where you don't really have any opportunity to counterattack. While not great, I think it's excused in this instance as frankly, it just looks cool. The way he disappears and reappears while attacking not only just looks amazing, it also does an amazing job of making you, the player, feel really cool for dodging as well. I think this is one of the biggest strengths of the fight. It looks stunning and makes you feel really cool at the same time. Guardian Ape, like a lot of other bosses on this list, doesn't really have that many flaws, but it's also kind of carried by the combat system he's in. Though obviously it isn't a negative that it plays to the strength of the combat system for the game he's in. Guardian Ape is just a fight that does everything above average while playing to the strength of the combat system, resulting in a fight that is at the same time very entertaining to play while still being fairly challenging. But let me get a bit more in depth about the things that I think Guardian Ape does especially well. The way his moves completely change between Phase 1 and 2 is done exceptionally well. In Phase 1, the ape is in control, something that results in a chaotic fight. It is a wild, rampaging animal that doesn't have much rhyme or reason for what it does. It makes for an interesting fight, but alone isn't that interesting. Where the fight really picks up is during the second phase. This is where the centipede takes control. He starts fighting with the sword and is a lot more calculated in his moves. There are still very big, broad attacks, doing a great job at looking like something else is controlling the body. This change is also reflected in the gameplay. In phase 1, it's more a focus on dodging and weaving in and out, as the monkey is unpredictable and hard to counter. In phase 2, this completely changes as now it fights with a sword and is more determined in his actions, changing the focus from dodging to parrying. Another nice detail from phase 1 to 2 is that the boss stops being afraid of firecrackers. Basically, every animal in the game is afraid of firecrackers, just like any normal animal would be. But as you change to phase 2 and the centipede takes control, the boss completely ignores the firecrackers, something I thought was a nice touch. The only negative that I can think of is that the arena is a bit wasted. There are several trees around the arena that you can grapple to, but the game never actually gives you any reason to do this. If anything, grappling to these trees is actively a bad idea, as it will lock you in animation which can result in you getting hit. Not sure what the idea was or if it was a scrapped idea, but it doesn't really negatively affect the fight. So yeah, to sum up, I think the main strengths of this fight come from his presentation. I honestly don't think any fight even comes close to the level of detail that you can see in the Guardian Ape, which is why I adore it so much. Obviously, the gameplay part is also well done, being a boss that is fun to play against and also quite challenging. All this culminating in what I would consider to be the second best boss in Sekiro. While I think a lot of people will agree with my placement of Ivory King, the same can't be said for my reasoning. 
As far as gameplay goes, I don't find the Ira King to be a particularly good boss. I would argue that most of his strengths come from his presentation and setup. From the very start, the way the fight is set up is really good. You get to talk to the Queen, who gives you some general backstory on the King and the area, and then asks you to go to gather the Knights of Liam Lois. As I've said previously, I generally like it when bosses have mechanics outside of the fight itself. In this case, it's that the game gives you a goal while you explore the area, which then later affects the final fight. The task itself is set up well, as you don't need to go out of your way to find them, like you do with the Fume Knight. You'll easily find them all by just exploring the area as you normally would. After you have gathered up your boys, it's time to start the fight. Immediately, the fight starts off strong, as the entrance to the fight is really cool. You drop down a massive hole with all your boys, as you get a good overview of the entire arena and a massive portal. The start of the fight is pretty much just an ad fight, though it's more interesting than your average ad fight as this time there actually is a goal. You hold off the turret knights as your own knights seal the portals by sacrificing themselves one by one. This is pretty fun and cinematic, very unlike other FromSoft fights. After you've sealed all the smaller portals, an absolute massive one opens up in front of the arena. Out of the portal walks the Ivory King, and this scene is one of the best entrances any boss has in the entire series. Though unfortunately, this is where my first problem with the fight is. After you've sealed all the portals, you still have one knight left over. Personally, I think this greatly takes away from the fight, as I would much rather it be a straight 1v1. If I wanted help, I would've just used the summon. You might counter this by saying that you don't need to pick up all the knights, but there's no way for you to know this your first time through, and there's no way to get rid of the knight once you have them picked up. Ignoring the extra knight, the second phase is pretty good, in both presentation and gameplay. Despite being another humanoid with a sword, his design is quite distinct. It does some good storytelling on its own, reaffirming many of the things you've been told or read so far. Though gameplay-wise, I do find him to be a bit lacking. His moveset is overall very simple, with nothing really all that noteworthy. I get the feeling that FromSoft held back in terms of difficulty because of the length of the fight. Because of all the stuff before the actual boss spawning, they might have intentionally made him a fairly forgiving boss so the player wouldn't be burnt out retrying him several times. Though this is purely speculation for my part. After having fought him for a bit, and dropping his HP by around a quarter, he will then infuse his sword with some ice magic stuff. Visually, he does look pretty dope, but it comes at the cost of gameplay. See, this effect does extend the reach of his weapon, but the amount feels very arbitrary. It is not the entire length of the visual effect, but it stops at some random point. This makes it fairly hard to judge the range of his attacks. You would also think that after he has applied this, it would last for the rest of the fight, but weirdly enough, if you fight him for long enough, it just kind of drops off. I don't really get why it does this, it just makes what is already a relatively easy fight even easier, and it just feels really random. And it's not like it's some secret cheese where you just run around until it runs out. Even if you fight him seriously, it will most likely run out before you manage to kill him as he has quite a lot of HP. I just find this so weird, like imagine you're fighting Fume Knight and then two thirds into the fight his flame coating just randomly drops. So overall, I find this fight to be very much style over substance. And this might be a bit of a hot take, but I actually really like this approach to fights. I don't think that every fight needs to be this complex fight with a million different mechanics that is really hard. Sometimes all you need in a fight is just appealing visuals that make you feel really cool. I am somewhat sad that I aren't really all that many other fights like the Ivory King, where the presentation took precedence, so I hope to see more in the future. Okay, to be fair, the start of this fight is lackluster. It's just you killing two ads while pulling them away from Nile. Thankfully, as long as you aren't on the level, you can just one-shot one of them as they spawn, making it so it isn't really all that tedious. Killing both the ads will make Nihil enraged, keeping his old moves beginning a wind and lightning effect and some new moves. To be completely honest, the main reason I like this fight so much is because how cool all of his moves look. I've always had a weak spot for characters who use likes to fight, and Nihil is no exception. Adding on top of this is lightning effects, and I think he's one of the most visually striking bosses in the entire game. His moveset gameplay-wise isn't really anything special. He's a slightly above average intermediate boss, not too easy, but not too hard. Most people probably beat him in like 1-2-3 tries. What really shines is how it feels to play against. He's the opposite of Morgad for me. All his attacks are big attacks are all distinct from each other. This makes Niall feel a lot more rewarding to dodge against and makes for a much better flow in his combat, both visually and in gameplay. Yeah, I don't know, I really don't have that much to say about him. I just think he's a blast to fight. Even if he isn't all that hard, only thing really holding him back in my opinion are the ads at the start of the fight and the fact that he isn't particularly hard. And to round out the very good tier, we have Father Gascoigne. Gascoigne is a two-phase boss. The first phase is an NPC-style fight where you're fighting against another humanoid. 
This works out in Gascoigne's favour, as fights against other hunters are the best type of fights in Bloodborne. Meanwhile, the second phase is a beast type enemy. This is a fantastic idea for several reasons. First, and most obviously, this spice up the fight by drastically changing it halfway through. But this also makes it so as an early game boss, Gascoigne prepares the player for the two most common types of fights in the game. I also think it's a fairly smart move to make his fight a decent chunk into the game, instead of right at the start, which means the developers had more of an opportunity to build up the fight and give him additional mechanics, such as interacting with his daughter and getting the music box. While we're on the topic of the music box, this is another reason why I think Gascoigne is a great fight. He actually has lore and therefore ties to the world. If you didn't know, you can actually meet Gascoigne's daughter before his fight. She'll mostly talk to you about him, giving you some backstory, and at the end, she'll give you a music box. If you use this music box during Gascoigne's second phase, you'll temporarily stun him. Personally, I think this adds a lot to the fight. Instead of just being some random character you know nothing about, he actually feels like a person, and therefore feels like you actually have a reason for fighting him other than just to progress to the game. Like I said previously, his phase 1 is a fight against another hunter, most likely the first one you'll have in the game. His moveset is pretty good here, a good mix between light and heavy attacks, giving you a good opportunity to learn both dodging and parrying with your gun. All of his attacks in this phase are good, with no outliers that feel unfair or just straight up bad. Moving on to the second phase, he'll transform into a beast. They give some a completely new moveset, making it so you have to completely change how you approach the fight. While you could take it fairly slow in phase 1 if you wanted to, this won't really work after he transforms. While in his beast form, Gascoigne is much more aggressive, like the name implies. He becomes a lot more predictable, not really caring much for defense and just rushing you down. Just like his phase 1, none of his attacks in this phase are problematic either. All are fun to play against, and none feel out of place or unfair. So as a whole, Gascoigne is pretty close to a flawless fight. The only reason why I'm not rating him higher is that he's an early game fight and therefore not having the same complexity as the bosses above him. Though there is one early fight that I would rate above him. Moving on from the very good, we have the great. This is the second to last tier and we'll cover 20 through 11, making it so the next video will be the final one and will be my top 10. Starting from here, fights stop really having any major flaws. They are rated on a combination of how good and how fun they are. I also want to highlight and explain my thought process and how I wrote about these bosses. Like with the tiers before, there is a big focus on the negative of these fights. This is simply because all of these fights are of such high quality that it's much easier to differentiate them on what they're doing poorly rather than what they're doing well. All of these bosses have fantastic movesets, making it so that there isn't much to say about their individual moves, unless they deviate from the norm and there are issues with them. I found this to be a more efficient and clear way to get across my thoughts on why one boss is ranked higher than another. But I want to make it clear that as a baseline, all of these bosses are fantastic. So don't confuse me criticizing these fights with me complaining or not liking them. I'll try to highlight whatever I think they do exceptionally well, but it will mostly be about flaws. Okay, with the disclaimer out of the way, let's get into the actual list. I command thee. I am the lord of all that is golden. To start off the tier, we have what I would consider to be the best early game boss FromSwept has made so far. Godric is a pretty fantastic fight. Never have they really managed to make an early game boss feel as complex and memorable even when compared to mid to late game bosses, while still managing to scale him to the early game where you meet him. On the topic of his gameplay, I didn't really find that much to talk about. All of his attacks are good, and they do a good job of preparing you for the rest of the game, while not really feeling like a tutorial boss at all. He's a nice mix of moves they have to deal with in different ways. He has his wind toss move to have to dodge in a specific direction, and he has his ground slam to either have to run away from or take the risk and jump in for more damage. Godric also does the thing that a lot of good bosses do, where he has two faces, with the second face just being a powered up version of his first face with some added moves. Godric is one of the better bosses that does this. He stays somewhat the same while being different enough to be refreshing to fight. He doesn't get too many new moves so you won't feel overwhelmed after the change, and the ones he does get are different enough from his base that he doesn't feel the exact same. Much like the area you find him in, he feels pretty perfectly balanced to your level when you fight him. He's the first proper hard fight that most people will meet, doing a good job of feeling hard, but not overwhelmingly so. If Elden Ring is your first FromSoft game, he'll give you the same feeling as Gas Coin or even Genichiro, the dopamine rush of clearing a hard challenger that will most likely get you hooked until you clear the rest of the game. Latorius is a pretty good example of what I was talking about earlier. Despite being one of my favorite fights in the entire series, I don't feel like I have that much to say about it. Atorius is such a banger of a fight, I think my notes summed it up perfectly. 
Good gameplay, good lore, good visuals, good music. There is one thing I think Artorias does especially well, and that is his lore. This includes before, after, and even before the fight itself. It's quite obvious that Artorias was one of the favourites for the devs. He has a bunch of lore, a lot of characters are directly tied to him, and they speak both frequently and highly of him. Even after all of this build up, his fight does not disappoint. Gameplay wise, there aren't really much to say. Like all other bosses this high up, his attacks are all good, and the fight has a fantastic flow. What this fight does really well is the storytelling it does. You really get a feel for his fall and how he has been corrupted by the Abyss. He's aggressive and pretty much just throws himself at you. Most likely because he can sense the Abyss or madness from you as you have the Pendant. This makes perfect sense as the one thing he hates is the Abyss. Even after being consumed by it, it is his only goal to obliterate it. Another great detail is his broken arm. The animation does a fantastic job of conveying this with his movements and his attacks. Most likely being broken as he was defending Sif, it further adds to the tragedy of his character. It also adds even more reason as to why his style is so aggressive. As it was mentioned earlier in the game, Artorias originally used a sword and a shield, but with his shield arm broken, he has no choice but to go all out on the offensive. Honestly, one of the only faults I have with this fight is that it's quite old now and therefore simply is not as fleshed out as later fights in the series. But honestly, I choose to see it as more of a positive that he managed to climb this high despite being a simpler fight than most of the other ones this high up. And Artorias is just a fantastic fight, easily one of my favourites in the entire series. He does a lot of heavy lifting when it comes to good fights in the original game. Though that being said, he isn't quite what I would call the best fight. That honour goes to... This might be a controversial one, as I assume as Taurus is most people's favourite fight in Dark Souls 1, and believe me, it was really hard deciding between these two. But in the end, I feel like Manus inches ahead ever so slightly by the fact that he has a more complex fight. Manus is honestly a rare one, as not only is he a fairly large boss, but he also has one of the best mixes of physical and magic attacks in the entire series. His physical attacks are done well, with all of them being distinct and easy to read, not falling into the same trap as many other big bosses where it can be hard to distinguish between their attacks. On top of this, it also has a fair amount of magic moves, which are for the most part good. There are situations where they get really poor RNG and he can spam spells one after another, but even then there is an item in the game that can help you out if you choose to use it. Though in my own experience I've never needed to use it as he uses his magic fairly sparingly, and all his attacks are dodgeable with good movements and well-timed rolls. If I had to say something about his moveset that I don't like, it's that occasionally when you're close to him and he does his jumping attack, he'll hit you with his feet as he starts the attack. This will stagger you and making so you tank the full hit no matter what. I don't think this was something that was intended and it's more of a result of you being inside his hitbox as he does the attack, and to be honest, it doesn't happen all that often so I don't really mind it that much. Manus was also one of the first fights in the entire series to actually have a combo, and honestly, it still holds up really well. His combo is a pretty long one, and he will lock into the entire thing once you get hit, the saving grace being that he has a pretty massive tell for it, so realistically, you shouldn't really ever get hit by it. I much prefer this style of combo attacks to the ones that they are doing currently. With Manus, it's an attack that he uses sparingly and is easy to dodge, but is devastating if you mess up and get hit by it. With the current combo moves, it's quite the opposite. Bosses will constantly be launching into long combos with up to double digit amounts of hit, forcing you to either be spam rolling or just stand far away waiting for it to end. I hope with whatever game they decide to do next, they look more to Manus and Bloodborne for inspiration rather than Elden Ring. Much like Artorias, Manus also has a pretty fantastic build up when it comes to his lore. As the father of the Abyss, there's a plethora of lore about this guy, with almost all of it being accessible before you fight him. Even if you aren't a big fan of reading item descriptions, just talking to NPCs in the DLC and Dusk in the main game, you'll get a pretty good idea about Manus. To add even further to this, Manus has one of the most unique and interesting designs in the entire game. Nothing really looks or fights quite like Manus, making him a memorable boss in the series filled with fantastic bosses. Just like with Artorias, I honestly just wish I could rate him higher. But with the restriction of being one of their older games, this is about as high as I feel I can realistically place him. But hey, it's a pretty respectable ranking if you ask me. As a concept, Solo of Cinder is one of the best in the entire series, both in gameplay and lore. It was honestly a genius idea to cap off the series, 
excluding the DLC, with a boss that is the amalgamation of every single person that has linked the fire before you. Making it so the boss has several different styles that he will switch between was a pretty clever use of gameplay mechanics for storytelling. It also makes for a pretty fantastic fight gameplay wise as there aren't really all that many other bosses in the series that completely changes their moveset bit fight. The balancing between each form is done pretty well, making it so that it's mostly up to the individual player what fighting stance they're good or bad against. Another big plus is that even if you manage to beat him in your first try, you will most likely get to see all, or at least most of his forms, as he swaps fairly often. Great for both letting you see them all, but also good for keeping you on your toes and not letting the fight get stale. And like that wasn't good enough, once you hit phase 2, man, phase 2 actually gave me goosebumps. Once you get into phase 2, he will once again change his fighting cell, to one you haven't seen yet, or at least not in this game you haven't. And just as you start to figure out, the piano hits. The pling pling plong. Man, it's honestly hard to describe just how well this worked on me. The simultaneous realization that you're fighting Gwyn and his theme starting to play hit like a truck. I genuinely did get goosebumps. Usually I'm not really one to care much for music in games, like you've probably noticed from me barely mentioning it up until this point, despite FromSoft having some of the best music in gaming. But man, I just can't get over how brilliant this moment was. Though obviously, it's not just this, even his moveset's fantastic, managing to keep the identity of Gwyn while still being able to update him enough to make him fit with a faster combat of Dark Souls 3. They fixed a few problems I had with Gwyn in Dark Souls 1, while adding more to him to make him an even better fight. This being said, he does have some problems. Despite the series being known for fantastic hitboxes, Soul of Cinder can be a bit wonky. He suffers from one of the same problems as Ivory King, where it's hard to tell what his actual range is at times. Some of his attacks have a tendency to hit you during rolls. This leaves me feeling not as refined as most of the other bosses in the game. As a final boss, I think Solo Cinder might be the very best I've ever fought. It's such a powerful ending to the series, excluding DLC, with no real flaws. You might think it's a bit weird for me to say this, as he isn't even in my final tier, and you're right, it is honestly a bit weird. The reason why I rate him this low on the list, while still thinking he's one of the best, is simply because as a Souls fight, he can be a bit lacking. I understand that they don't want to make him too difficult as everyone will have a chance to beat him, and this hurts him overall as a Souls fight. While he is an interesting concept as a fight, he is also fairly easy. I feel as though most people will probably clear this fight within 1-3 to three tries. This is fine from the point of view of storytelling, but leaves him feeling a bit lackluster from a mechanical perspective. If he was made to be as hard as, say, Melania or Freed, then he could easily be in my top 5. But I am glad that they made him the way he is, really focusing on the storytelling aspect instead of the gameplay was a good idea, and paid off in the end. I think it will be a very long time until FromSoft manages to top this as a final boss. Welcome, honored guest, to the birthplace of our dynasty. This is specifically referring to his second and last fight, as I won't be rating his first in the series. As you've probably noticed already, with the exception of Margit, I wouldn't really be including teaser fights like the first spoke in this list. With that out of the way, let's actually get talking about the fight, though honestly, even though most of this is scripted, I'm not even sure what to say about Moog. Even when I was fighting him, I didn't really think Moog was anything special. His moveset is good with no big flaws, he even has a good mix between physical and magic attack. It's just, overall he feels a bit lackluster, like there isn't anything special about his fight that gets me really interested. I think this comes from a combination of things in the fight and outside the fight. Like I said, his fight is good, but there isn't really anything special that I noticed and latched onto. The same thing can honestly be said about his presentation and lore. Design-wise, I found Moog to be a bit boring. He is a big dude, making him quite intimidating, helped even more by his demonic design, but overall he ends up feeling a bit generic. This feeling also carries on when it comes to his lore. There isn't really all that much about Moog, a lot of his story and lore is just kind of unknown currently. This ends up being a shame as Mikla is in his arena, one of the most interesting lore characters of the entire game, but the way he is used is a waste, he's kind of just there. Obviously, this might and probably will get expanded upon when the DLC comes out and all of this will just age horribly, but as things currently stand, I just feel like it's a waste. There's also the whole omen part, but even here, I think he's just outclassed by his brother, who goes much more in depth exploring the theme central to the omen. It is a shame, as obviously shown by his rating, I do still think fairly highly of his fight, but a lot of this comes from him being one of the harder bosses in the game. 
Not to be a Debbie Down or anything, but I do also have problems with the actual gameplay part of his fight. This mostly comes down to the transition to his second phase. The game straight up does a piss poor job at explaining what is even happening here. There isn't really any indication that there's anything you can do about the life drain that happens here. I know that FromSoft loves to leave stuff like this ambiguous, but it just doesn't work in this example. This is made even worse by the fact they had the perfect item in the game already they could have used. The way you counter is by having a specific tier in your flask, a tier you picked up significantly earlier in the game and is very easy to miss. There is also another item that counters him that is way harder to miss, and has a lot more build up throughout the game, that being his shackles. Just like his brother, Moog also has shackles that can be found in the overworld, and then used against him in the fight to stun him for a brief time, where you can do a lot of damage to them. This is a reinforced mechanic as you can use it against Margit, Morgoth, and the first iteration of Moog, all before you fight the final Moog. They literally had the perfect item to use as a mechanic to counter this transition. And yet, they decided to make it some arbitrary item hidden inside another mechanic. Don't get me wrong, I actually quite like this mechanic on paper. If I had been countered by the shackles, I'd probably be raving about it in this section instead. But alas, I feel as though FromSoft really blundered here. But still, overall, I think Moog is a fun fight. Just like his brother, Moog is challenging, but fair, with a varied moveset that never really feels boring to play against, even if you have technically fought them both before. With a varied moveset that never really feels boring to play against, even if you have technically fought them before. I do think the addition of outside items was poorly done in this case, but it's not so bad that I'm really dropping it all that many slots on the list. You can just look it up online after all. My only wish is that the fight felt more unique. As it stands, it's an unfortunately forgettable fight, even if it is a good one. Tonight, Gammon joins the hunt. Gurman is what I would consider to be the best jewel type fight in the entire series. While there are several other fights in the list that are higher, and are also one on one fights, none of them quite fit in the jewel theme as much as Gurman does. Most of these other fights will have things added to them, such as magic or other such powers. Meanwhile, Gurman doesn't really have anything like this. He does have a power up in phase 2, but other than doing an initial AoE damage around him, it doesn't add anything magical to the fight. He basically just pops a beast blood pellet and hits harder. Also, unlike other fights, he will actually stagger easily, just like the player does. All of this culminates in what I would call a duel, a fair fight between two opponents on an even playing field. If anything, it's the player that has the advantage when it comes to this fight. Being a duel works perfectly for this fight, both in terms of lore and combat. I wouldn't really be going into the lore as it would just take way too long, as I would have to explain a lot of Bloodrun lore, so let me explain the gameplay side at least. Throughout the game, you have several fights against other hunters. For most of these, there will always be some other element that stops it from being a straight up duel, like the blood slash fire magic with Maria and the second phase of Gascoin. But there is none of this with German. He is a pure 1v1 all the way through. Even though I literally just critiqued Moog for not having a wow factor in his kit, I'm about to praise German for doing that exact thing. I think it was a pretty brave decision to leave German as plain as he is, but I think it was well worth it. German is basic, his movements are fairly limited. Aside from a few lunging attacks and jumps, he doesn't really move all that much different from the player. All of these aspects compound together and build upon one another to create a perfect hunter fight. I do have one complaint with the fight, and even this I'm not quite sure of myself, but I do think the fight is a bit too easy. On one hand, I do like the fact that he is somewhat weak, as it makes sense as German is old as shit and well past his prime. But on the other hand, I would have loved to fight German in his prime, in a proper hard fight that really challenges me. Basically, from a storytelling perspective, I think this was a good decision, but I can't help being greedy and wanting it to be a harder fight, like what they did with Koss. Still, I'm happy that I got at least one proper hunter fight in the game, and what a banger it was. You've done quite enough. Now have your rest. The Twin Princess is one of the last fights on the list that aren't simply a 1v1 against another humanoid enemy, and probably one of the fights in the entire series that executes their leech the best. I wish that FromSoft would focus more of their energy on fights like this, as they're fairly rare. While the princes are technically humanoid enemies, the fight is done in such a way that it's wholly unique. Personally, I think this is a very impressive fight, as not only does it manage to be mechanically impressive, but it is also fantastic in a storytelling sense. And I don't only mean this in their dialogue, but through their attacks as well. Like interactions between the brothers during the fight, as Lothric enhances Lorien's attacks or Lorien acting as Lothric's likes despite not actually having any himself. 
Like with the bosses before, I won't be getting into any specific lore, but this is definitely another fight that is enhanced by knowing the lore beforehand. It is also a fight where the lore is enhanced by the fight itself. I love when FromSoft does fights like this, where there was obviously a lot of effort and care put into mixing in the lore of the characters into their fight. Though, the most impressive part is how they managed to not only weave in the lore, but also make the fight mechanically better while doing so. Twin Princess is another fight where Phase 1 is a good fight, and Phase 2 expands upon that foundation by enhancing certain attacks and adding complex new ones. The way Twin Princess does this is by having Lothar join the fight in Phase 2, making him have his own unique attacks and enhancing some of Lorraine's. It might sound simple and obvious, but I genuinely think this was a stroke of genius from the devs, and I don't think FromSoft has quite managed to hit this level of detail in any fight after this one. I sure have done a lot of gushing so far, and I'm not done yet. Not only is the Twin Princess one of the best and unique duo fights in the game, but even if you were to only look at Lorien on his own, I think the fight is quite fantastic. Like every other boss this high up, he has a good moveset, where I don't think any of his moves are particularly problematic. Most of his swings are fairly slow but hard hitting, something that could be seen as bad as with other bosses, but Lorien makes up for this with his unique mechanic. On top of having Lothric join in phase 2, Lorien also has a teleport mechanic, where he'll teleport around the room before or even during certain attacks. Teleporting is a pretty interesting mechanic that is surprisingly not used all that often. Most times where it's used, it's more of a break in the fight, only exceptions being Gale and Placidious Axe, so basing an entire fight around this should have been a no-brainer. This being said, I think they did a pretty good job at it. Lorien uses it fairly often, but not so often that getting attacks in is frustrating. His attacks also mix in the teleport pretty well, even the ones that weren't specifically made for it. The tracking is even fairly competent, as long as Lorien doesn't teleport out of your lock range, but it is fairly rare for the lock to break during a teleport. If I were to have any criticism of the mechanic, it's that I wish it had more of an auditory cue. If they made it so that you could track it purely by sound, I think it would add a lot to the fight as you wouldn't even need to lock on to know where he is. Added to that, humans react faster to sound than visuals, making it easier for people that are struggling with the fight to react in time. Overall, the Twin Princess is one of my favourite fights in the entire series when looked at as a whole. The only reason why it doesn't rank any higher is mostly because the fights above it are just more complex and therefore more interesting as fights. It might feel a bit cheap to rank it lower despite all of which I've said, but it is a fight tier after all. I'm just glad I got to gush about a fight that I really really like. Just like with the previous fight, Radon is definitely another fight which is greatly enhanced by knowing his lore beforehand. Radon is a bit easier to know the lore as you get a bit of a lore dump by the announcer and a cutscene just before the fight. Though I don't think Radon expands as much upon this in his actual gameplay. He does have his gravity magic and, and of course his horrors, but other than that there isn't really much more. The reason why I think his lore makes this fight better is also a reason a lot of people might miss out on by no fault of their own. See, for some reason, FromSoft decided this was going to be a fight that you can not only summon for, but you are heavily incentivized to do so, as you basically have an infinite amount of summons that can more or less solo the fight for you. While I think this mechanic on its own isn't a bad addition, it even has one of my favourite examples of a joke in a Souls game with patches just piecing out of your world after seeing that you're fighting for Dawn. I think it's a bit of a shame that they chose Radon as the fight to do this. Personally, I think it would be better suited for some sort of absolute massive boss where fighting it alone is genuinely a big ask. While I do think Radon is a fairly hard boss, and he is a bit of a big boy, I don't think he's hard enough to where you need a near infinite amount of summons. A lot of my enjoyment for this fight comes with the feeling of the warrior's honor type duel between you two. You're not only finally being able to put Radon to rest after him losing his mind to the Scarlet Rot, but you do so in a way befitting of a man of his stature. Killing him by summoning a million phantom to help you just feels wrong when looked at from this perspective and takes away from the fight. I do want to say that I don't think any lesser people that do choose to kill him this way. Everyone plays the game differently and there's nothing wrong with that. Just that in my personal experience I'm not a big fan of it for my playthrough. As far as this gameplay goes, he is pretty fantastic. Other than an unfortunately tedious start to the fight, I don't have any issues with anything in his first phase. Both before and after he has magic to his swords, he is a joy to fight. His big sweeping attacks are just the right speed and size to not feel too easy to dodge, yet punishing when you do mess up. He also has a pretty large arsenal of attacks, but they aren't all that different from each other. Something that really helps with making it so his fight never feels stale, yet not making it overly complicated with a lot of moves to memorize. This is then follow up on why I consider it to be one of the coolest transitions FromSoft has done. I think the fact that there are several videos with millions of views on YouTube that are just people reacting to it just speaks for itself. 
After this, Radon gets several new moves, many of which being magic attacks. This is where I think the fight slightly dips in quality. There isn't anything egregious here, but overall I think it takes away from the fight. There are a couple of moves that I don't think are up to par with the rest of his kit. That being the attack where he puts rocks above his head and his weird dashing attack. Starting off with the former, it's just a weird attack. It's similar to past attacks in the series like Hoving Soul Mass in Dark Souls 1, but it comes with such an insane delay. Instead of just going off relatively soon after being cast, they linger for what can be minutes before he uses them. And even then, they're a bit of a nightmare to actually dodge, as if you don't create enough distance from Radon, they come towards you very fast, followed by Radon himself. And as for the latter, it's also just a weird attack. It doesn't particularly fit the rest of his fight. He just toils around, flying through the air. It honestly looks a bit bizarre. It can also be fairly hard to even see what is going on as he's doing it. All the time, he'll fly into the camera, making it impossible to see anything. Other than these minor hiccups, I think Radon is a pretty fantastic fight. I honestly find it a shame that they nerfed him, as I found him to be one of the more enjoyable fights in Elden Ring pre-nerf. But if a significant portion of the player base was stuck on him, then it is what it is, I suppose. <laughs> Ludwig is honestly a very similar fight to Radon, though ironically enough I have more of criticisms for Ludwig. Before I get into those, I'll quickly go through the positives. Like I said, Ludwig is very much like Radon to me, just a solid fight with a great flow to it. There are two main reasons why I decided to place him above Radon, those being the fact that Ludwig is in Bloodborne, so I just have a natural bias towards the combat. And the fact that Ludwig doesn't have the same problem with summons as Radon. Ludwig is just a nice clean one on one. Now, for my criticism. First being, I think there is a pretty big difference in the quality between Phase 1 and Phase 2. This is a very subjective take, but I'm not a huge fan of the animalistic beast fights, like his Phase 1. I don't think they're bad, but I do prefer more standard fights, like what his Phase 2 is. I enjoy it when it is a bit slower and methodical, instead of having a giant screaming beast run at me constantly. He's very much the same as Garden Ape in this regard. Ludwig is also one of the few fights this high up where I actually have a problem with one of his attacks. See. In phase 1, he has an attack where he jumps into the sky and jumps down on you, without really being able to see him. Because of this, you have to mainly rely on muscle memory to dodge it. There are other attacks like this in Fromsoft, and I'm not a huge fan of those either. With most of them, you just have to get hit a few times in order to learn the timing, and then you'll be fine. This isn't great, but it doesn't ruin a fight for me. Problem is, this doesn't work with Ludwig. For some reason, they decided this wasn't what they were going to do for his version. This time, they were going to make it random. That being said, I don't actually know if it's literally random, but it does at the very least have several different timings where you can come down, so it honestly doesn't really matter if it is. This makes the attack impossible to reliably dodge, and you kind of have to guess and hope you're lucky. Other than this, I don't really have any more problems with Phase 1. Phase 2 is where the fight dramatically improves for me as he gets a sword and becomes very similar to Radon. In both, you are a lone man fighting against someone much larger than you who is wielding a sword. They both have the same sort of massive swings, being more AoE attacks than anything. They both have the same sort of flow to them, Ludwig being slightly more enjoyable as the combat system is just simply better. Another pretty big plus for Ludwig is that I personally found his fight to be a bit harder. I don't think Radon is an easy boss, but Bloodborne was overall a much harder game, especially when it came to the DLC that Ludwig is from. To be completely honest, if I were to rate Ludwig equally with his phase 1 and 2, he'd be a fair bit lower on the list. But I think his phase 2 is mainly what the fight was meant to be, and what sticks with you even after you beating the fight. Also, if you're getting fed up with my Bloodborne bias, then don't worry, there's only a couple more to go. Starting with phase 1, and we're already running into one of my problems with the fight. On its own, I don't really have any problems with this phase. Most of my problems come from it being coupled with the Nameless King. The King of the Storm is fine on his own, if not a bit annoying to fight. He's a pretty prime example of a fight where you have to spend most of the time just standing around and waiting for the boss to let you hit it. Most of his attacks are based around flying or swaying his head around, which is the only part of his body you really want to hit. Except for a fire breathing attack and a couple of attacks where the Nameless King directly swings at you, there aren't really all that many openings. 
The main suggestion for approving this fight is somewhat simple, though they might be a bit controversial. I think they should have removed the Ancient Wyvern altogether and just replaced the fight with one against the King of the Storm. This would make it so that the start of the area actually has a proper fight instead of one of the worst in the entire series, but also make it so they can flesh out the King of the Storm. Another positive with this would be making it so that the Nameless King doesn't have a dud of a first phase, making him more room for fleshing out his own kit. By not having a completely different fight at the start of it, makes it so that the devs don't have to be afraid of making him too complex with the fear of making the fight too hard or too long. The second phase is where I really had trouble with raiding. This is what really made me decide how much weight I wanted to place on the first time meeting a boss. Some bosses really just don't hold up that well after having fought them several times and only really truly shine the first time. I think the Nameless King is a perfect example of this. The first time people fight this boss, the consensus is that he's a fairly challenging fight, but still a fun one. Obviously, every boss becomes easier after you've managed to beat it at least once, but I think Nameless King suffers a lot more from this than most bosses. After you've beaten this boss at least once, the fight becomes a walk in the park. All of his moves start to feel really slow and easy to react to, making the entire face a bit of a joke. Now, the question was, was I going to rate it off of my experience with him the first time or my latest time? Eventually, I decided on putting more importance on the first experience with the boss, making it so that I would do the same with most bosses. My main reason for this is that I think every boss is the most enjoyable the first time you fight it. Adding to this, I'm not really the type of person that enjoys playing or watching something several times, making it so that I would most likely have an unfair bias towards fights such as this one. While I understand that some might disagree and would rather have a criteria for the fight being how it scales with New Game Plus, but I'm just not that type of player. This is also my list, and I want to make it feel more personal by having my own biases play a big part instead of trying to be as objective as possible. I think this makes the video more unique while also being more enjoyable to make. I hope you think so too. And finally, we get to the last tier. The Amazing tier is reserved for what I consider to be the best of the best. All of these fights are what I believe makes FromSoft games as special as they are. While some of the fights in previous tiers might have been carried by other things outside of the specific mechanics of the fights, all of the fights from here on out are fantastic in both presentation and gameplay. It also coincidentally ended up having 10 fights in it, so I guess this is also my top 10 FromSoft fights. But I want to keep this video under 5 hours long, so let's get into it. Starting with... Fast disclaimer, I'm just going to refer to this whole boss fight as Demon Prince for simplicity's sake. And we finally get to what I consider to be the best duo fight that FromSoft has done so far. Though some might be a bit hesitant to call this a duo fight because it's only the first phase that has two enemies, though I would argue that this is a major factor as to why this is such a good boss. But first, let's break down why I think the first phase works so well. So the way the first phase works is that there are two bosses. For most of the phase, only one of the bosses are going to be active, while the other one will be cooling down. The active one will actively be running you down, mainly using melee attacks while the other one will be keeping his distance and occasionally shooting projectiles. This is such a simple system of making a duo boss that I'm surprised that FromSoft hasn't really done it before. And no, I'm not counting the double dragon biters from Dark Souls 2. Another really important part of this fight that makes it work is that they added a new way of doing projectile attacks. Usually, when a projectile is fired, there isn't any indication outside of you literally seeing the object flying towards you. But with this fight, they added an indicator for its path. This makes it so you only really need to focus on the active one chasing you down, while still being able to keep track of the other boss's attacks. This coupled with the active one having a good moveset that manages to be aggressive while still leaving plenty of openings for counterattacks, you have a kind of simple but extremely fun duo fight. I do have some minor problems with it, such as the passive boss sometimes making his way up to melee range and swinging at you. This instantly makes the fight a mess, but it's pretty rare. The first phase is also fairly easy as neither of them have all that much HP, and they leave big openings for damage when they power up and down. That being said, I do feel as though this is intentional as the second phase is pretty challenging on its own. Once you kill both demons in phase 1, the second demon you kill will then transform into the prince. The order in which you kill the first phase actually changes the moveset the second phase has, which is a pretty interesting mechanic. This does come with some drawbacks, as one of the versions is a fair bit easier than the other. Though I suppose you could argue this is a good thing as the players can learn this and target to kill them in a specific order. Either way, whichever one you kill last will grow to many times its size and get a much larger HP bar. Mechanics wise, the fight isn't all that different from the first phase. Moveset wise, the Demon Prince is pretty similar to the active demon in phase 1, though much larger and a bunch of new moves of course. He feels pretty good to fight for being a bigger boss. I find that a lot of larger bosses have a tendency to become a bit messy. 
but the Demon Prince does a pretty good job of being readable, and keeping his distance so you get to see what he's doing. Depending on which demon you killed in the first phase, he will have different special moves. He will either spawn a bunch of orbs that he'll throw at you, or he'll shoot a massive laser. First, the orb attack is pretty bullshit and it's generally suggested that you avoid going against it. It's way too hard to dodge and the fight devolves into a bit of a shit fest whenever he uses it. The laser attack on the other hand is way easier to handle. Most of the time you can just run up to him without having to deal with it at all, leaving you with plenty of time to lay into him. At first I used to not like this choice and I thought that you should balance them, but I like the fact that you can learn which is easier to deal with and deliberately get it every time. If it were a random mechanic you had no control over then I would hate it, but since you can choose I think it's a pretty decent mechanic. Also if you think the fight is too easy and you're a masochist you can actually choose the harder one so there's that. I don't really have that much to say presentation or lore wise. There isn't really all that much easily accessible lore about this boss in the game, so it doesn't get that much of a boost from that, such as fights like Twin Princes and Radon. I do like the presentation a lot though. The fact that you entered the fight by taking a massive plunge into the arena is unique and cool. The bosses themselves are pretty distinct looking, even when it comes to other bosses in the series. This is especially impressive when you consider the fact that once you take a closer look at them, they're actually quite reminiscent of the Messengers of God, the weird looking white demon things that fly to Alondo in Dark Souls 1. That's about it for what I have to say about this boss. Overall, it's a fairly simple boss when you break it down, yet somehow manages to be what most other duofights couldn't. Good. I'm not sure how they managed to make such a banger of a duofight in Dark Souls 3 and then completely fuck up every duo boss in Elden Ring. It's like they completely forgot they even made the Demon Prince and just went back to slapping two random enemies into the same arena and calling it a day. I really hope they decide to design more duo fights like the Demon Prince and Gargoyles instead of continuing to make bosses like Godskin Duo. Lady Maria is one of the most memorable characters in the entire game, despite this fight being the only time you actually get to meet her. You hear so much about Lady Maria throughout the game, from both item descriptions and NPC dialogue. She's built up to be this pinnacle of a hunter and you get to make all sorts of theories in your head about who this character might be. And then finally in the DLC, you get to meet her and she does not disappoint. Her cutscene, her design, her arena, all iconic. After having played the DLC, Lady Maria was instantly my favourite character FromSoft has ever made. And this was kept up until the release of Elden Ring, where she was finally dethroned by someone a bit higher on the list. Also, the realization that the doll was modeled after Lady Maria is still one of my most memorable experiences I've ever had in a FromSoft game. All this is just further expanded upon when you get to her actual fight, and Ruset does a fantastic job at making you feel like you're fighting against another hunter. The only fight that does this better being Gurman. This mostly comes from the fact that once you hit a certain HP threshold, Lady Maria will buff her attacks with blood and then fire. I think this is overall a worthy trade-off as it makes Maria overall a much harder fight, ultimately making her the better fight. With a more complex moveset and simply more mechanics, she gives you a challenge that German simply couldn't with his simpler moveset. I do very much like both fights for these two different reasons, but overall I think Lady Maria is the better fight because of it. Though I do run into the problem I talked about briefly about in the last tier when talking about Maria. There just isn't anything about her moveset that stands out, making it hard to really talk about it in more depth. All of her attacks are fantastic and when put together you get what I would almost call a perfect moveset. The only thing that puts her below the rest of the bosses on the list are difficulty and complexity. While she achieves a flow of combat that not a lot of bosses manage, Maria has just been outdone by newer bosses that have minute differences in how fun I find them. That being said, she is a boss to fight, made even better by her lore and presentation. If I had to muster up some criticism for her, it's that she, despite what I said about her being harder than German, she still isn't all that hard. Even in my first time, it didn't take me all that long to beat her. And this was without exploiting the fact that she basically has zero poise. She is definitely one of my favourite fights, who over time has simply been pushed down by newer fights. But she'll always stay a core gaming memory for me. Gameplay-wise, Ishin is what I would consider to be my favourite final boss in any of the FromSoft games, not counting any of the DLC bosses. A lot of this comes from Ishin being the only final boss that I actually think is really difficult. Counting total time spent on any boss, Ishin was easily my number one until Elden Ring was released, when a certain someone showed up and destroyed that record, but we'll get to her in a bit. 
I'm honestly not sure if this was the average experience with Ishin, but man it took me a while. Despite this, I never found him to be unfair in any way. Every time I died, I could acknowledge that this was purely my own fault. Well, instead of speaking so broadly, let's get into a bit more depth. Ishin is a very long fight, with four main phases. The first phase is another showdown with Ginichiro. Instead of feeling a bit tiring seeing how this is technically a third fight against him, I really like this design decision. First, it's a nice way of showing the player the progression of their skills throughout the game. At the start of the game, you get a baseline. Most likely, you get your ass beat and Ginichiro cuts up your arm. Next, you get to meet him a bit into the game, after you get more comfortable with the game mechanics, and after a struggle, you finally beat him. And then finally, you get to meet him at the end of the game, when you have finally mastered the game and it feels like a reverse of the start of the game, where you'll most likely stomp him in the arena he cut off your arm many hours ago. Gameplay-wise, Genichiro here isn't really all that different to what he was like the last time you fought him. This makes sense in both narrative sense and gameplay, as this plays into what I said earlier about showing you how much you've progressed. Making him push over was also necessary, as he is only the first of four faces in this boss fight. After having dealt with Genichiro, we finally get to the actual fight, as we get to see Ishin quite literally crawl out of Genichiro's neck. The second phase of the fight is just a normal duel against Ishin. For Ishin's first phase, he's pretty standard. He will for the most part only use his sword, making him somewhat similar to Genichiro in that sense. He does utilize most of the mechanics in the game, such as McCarry counters and attacks you have to jump over. I'm just going to say this now so I won't have to repeat myself later, but throughout all of Ishin's faces, he never has any problematic attacks. Overall, his moveset is well done, having a nice mix between faster and slower attacks, while still managing to make him the hardest fight in the game. As we get to phase 3 is where I feel like Ishin really comes into his own. When you enter phase 3, Ishin will pull out a giant spear that he will use alongside his sword. This spear is what mostly makes this fight what it is in my head, as once he gets his spear, he immediately feels more unique. Instead of being yet another humanoid with the sword, he now has a mix between both sword attacks and spear attacks. Overall, this has several effects on the fight. First, changing the way you have to play around him. By increasing his range, it makes so you can't just play right outside of his sword range anymore. You do have to fully engage him in close combat, parrying most of his attacks, or you have to play more of a style where you dip in and out to get attacks on him. Phase 4 is honestly more of the same. The only thing that really changes in this phase is that he'll throw in some lightning attacks. Sadly, I don't think this really adds anything to the fight. The only thing it really achieves is making it easier. The hardest thing about the lightning mechanic is knowing that it exists, as hitting it back to him is really easy and does a pretty substantial amount of damage. This makes it so as long as you get comfortable with this phase 3 and you beat it, you will most likely be able to clear the fight in a try or two. I don't really have a problem with this as the fight is already pretty long and challenging. If they had made the last phase even harder, I think the fight would have been too challenging and overall making it worse. If I were to have any criticism on this fight, it's that it's a bit too easy to abuse. Same with some past fights in the game, there isn't really anything stopping you from just sprinting around the arena occasionally going in for a hit. This way you don't actively have to dodge anything while still whittling him down. This doesn't really change my opinion on the fight since I don't do this, but I guess it could be seen as poor design that it's possible at all. All in all, Ishin is a pretty fantastic fight that manages to constantly change throughout its duration, while never feeling overly complicated or losing its identity. Ishin really makes me hope that FromSoft will continue making their final fights more of a challenge instead of having them be on the easier side, as with most of their older games. Elden Ring does make me a bit more hopeful that this is true, but it will have to wait and see how to release more games. Upon my name as Godfrey, the first Elden Lord. Cadre is a beast. He's easily one of the most likable characters in the entirety of Elden Ring. He's another great example of a fight where the game does a fantastic job of building him up before his fight with the use of item descriptions, NPC dialogue, and cutscenes. This is further expanded upon when you finally get to face him yourself. At first, this was a shock to me. I did not think I was going to get to face him. I thought at best he was going to be some important lore character that we don't get to see until the DLC, like with Atorius or Lady Maria. And when you do get to fight him, he matches up perfectly with the image you have built of him. In his first phase, he's a blast to fight, with a versatile moveset that takes in use fast attacks, slow attacks, and the attacks you have to jump over, and blend them together in such a way that gives the fight a fantastic flow. There is barely any downtime, as when you aren't actively attacking or dodging, you'll still be positioning, 
even if you aren't just healing after getting the shit beat out of you. I truly don't have any complaints about its first phase and it only gets better in phase 2. Once you get Godfrey to half health, it plays a cutscene. His transition from Godfrey to Horalu is pure hype, completely tearing up his clothes and covering himself in blood, really giving you the sense that this is truly the chieftain of the Badlands. This comes with a pretty significant change to his gameplay. Instead of using a battle axe and being somewhat slow, he instead switches to purely using his fist. With this, he also becomes a lot more aggressive and in your face. In this phase, basically half of his moves become grab attacks as his combat style changes to that of a grappler. This fits really well with his image as the chieftain of the Badlands and makes his second phase feel completely unique compared to any other boss in the series. But the most important part of either of these phases is how it makes you feel, not specifically what you're doing. Despite both phases being completely different in terms of how you approach them, they both do a fantastic job of making you just feel cool. I think this is extremely important when you consider who you are fighting. Godfrey is not a character that cares much about all the politics that's going around you and that most characters will talk about. He has no ill will towards you when you defeat him, if anything he's happy to have been defeated by what he considered to be a superior fighter. This fight just elevates just how much of a cool dude Godfrey really is, and because of this I think it makes the fight a lot more enjoyable. I find that presentation is a pretty major factor as to how much I enjoy a fight, and Godfrey is one of the best at this. Horror Lou also easily has some of the coolest looking attacks in the entire game. It is honestly just a blast to get grabbed by this man. Champion Gunder is probably the best example of what I would call a dual fight in the series. Of course, I don't mean this as just a one-on-one, -on -one, but dual fights are more the type of fights where I feel like, even in lore, the fight is completely even. There aren't any special circumstances like magic or additional people, just a straight one-on-one -on -one where you're both using the tools that you have on you. It's pretty much the same as what I was talking about with German, though I do think Gundir does it better. To start with, and this is more important to me than I feel like it is with most people, but Gundir just looks cool. And I'm not really referring to his appearance, though he isn't a lame looking boss. I'm more referring to the way he fights. He's one of the rare bosses where his fighting style feels grounded and realistic. Compared to the real world, the way he fights isn't all that realistic, but in the Dark Souls universe, it does. He doesn't have any excessively over the top moves, he mostly just fights with his halberd and his own limbs. It's a pretty huge plus for me as I love unarmed combat. I think it just looks really cool. Gunyu does have some specific moves that looks especially cool, like his attack where he throws you in the air and kicks you away, but I'm focused on the overall feel of his moveset. After Gundir, and even more so after Horalu, I really hope that FromSoft makes a boss in the future that exclusively does unarmed combat. Gundir is another one of those bosses where I honestly don't even have that much to say, despite being one of my favourites. Much like Commander Nile, this is just one of those fights that I, for lack of a better word, really like the vibe of. He does stick out with his placement as he isn't as complex or important as the bosses around him. I just happen to really like him. A lot of the reason why I do enjoy him so much is just the overall feel of the fight. And most of that comes from what I have already said. Gameplay wise there isn't much for me to say. He doesn't really have any problematic moves. The only one I can really think of is the attack where he charges at you with his halberd. This move can be a bit awkward to dodge depending on where you're standing compared to the boss, but even then it just becomes a problem of your positioning and not the attack being bad. So overall I rate this fight high for the flow it has, paired with his presentation. And honestly, if you have fought this fight yourself, I think you know exactly what I mean. These last four fights were by far the hardest to rate. The difference in my personal opinion of them is minuscule and I went back and forth on their positions, so honestly by the time this comes out I might have changed my mind of a couple of them, but eventually I just decided to lock them in place so I could actually write this last bit. So unfortunately the boss that came up last out of these four was Gale. Obviously, this isn't to say that Gale is a weak fight in any way. If anything, I think Gale is probably one of the most visually stunning fights in any of the Dark Souls games. What it ultimately came down to was a mix of minor problems and things out of his control, like who he is and what game he's in, but let's get a bit more specific. His face mode is very simple, he doesn't have anything that is particularly hard to dodge and honestly overall acts like what Genichiro was to the Ishin fight. I do like the presentation of it though, the arena coupled with his more animalistic behaviour does have interesting lore implications, making it a bit more interesting. Where the fight really gets started is in his face too. 
When he does get into his phase 2, he gets a cutscene, which I'm normally not too big of a fan of when it comes to harder fights like Gale. I much prefer it in the fight so you'll be in like 1 or 2 tries, but this obviously isn't a major problem. Other than this, Phase 2 is a pretty fantastic fight. There are a lot of things I specifically like about this fight that aren't done that much in other ones. One such thing is his cape. Not only is it really cool looking, but it's also very clever gameplay wise. Normally, when bosses get effects that extend their range, that is all that it does, so it isn't all that hard to play around, and you usually don't really even have to change the way you approach the fight. But with Gale, not only does it extend his range, but there is also a slight delay to the attack. This makes it so that you not only have to consider the range of the attack, but also the timing and direction you roll in. If you roll how you would normally dodge your sword swings, then you will most likely get hit by the lingering cape effect. So you have to either dodge extremely late, fitting into the very tight window where you have iframes for both his sword and cape, or you have to roll in such a way that you don't get hit by the cape at all. This adds a lot of complexity to the fight when compared to other humanoids with swords, and is probably my favorite mechanic of the fight. But there are still several others that I want to talk about. One such mechanic is his use of several types of attacks. While I might have just complimented Gunder for his lack of variety, Gale does the opposite and does it extremely well. Not only does Gale have his sword and cape, but he also has a miracle, a crossbow, and even summoning signs. I'll be starting with the miracle as I think this is the worst part of his face. On its own, it's not that bad. All it does is throw out 3 to 5 rings in front of him that will return after a certain delay. The problem comes with the fact that more often than not, it'll just clip into the ground, make it so that you can't see them at all. This makes it so you just have to completely avoid where they are instead of actively trying to dodge them. Obviously, this isn't a major issue, but it's just something I noticed while fighting him. His crossbow attacks are a lot better, though I do still have some issues with them. He has several attacks where he'll use his crossbow, all of which are completely fine when viewed from the viewpoint of dodging them. But the problem comes from how he uses it. Usually, you would think that an enemy using a ranged attack when you're close would be beneficial to you, but not with Gale, as when he pulls out his crossbow, you can't really get in any counterattacks. For the most part, you just have to play safe and wait for this attack to end, even if you are really close to him. This isn't really much of a problem, as most of the time he uses his crossbow, it's either to create distance, or during an attack where he's unable to get hit anyways. One pretty big plus with the crossbow is that it's a pretty sick weapon. It's a completely unique weapon to Gale, as it's a special repeating crossbow. This coupled with the fact that most of his attack where he uses it looks great, and it becomes one of the most memorable parts of the fight. Lastly, and this, this one is more of a cool interaction than anything, but Gale actually has a teleport attack while he will summon himself with a summoning sign to attack you. The attack itself isn't really that interesting, it's more the fact that he uses something that is an established game mechanic that NPCs never actually interact with against you that is interesting. It does kinda leave me wishing they used more stuff like this during the fight, but it's still a very interesting mechanic. Phase 3 is where most of my actual problems with the fight come in. In Phase 3, he will stop using several of his attacks from Phase 2, and replace them with attacks that I'm not really a fan of. The two most prominent ones are an attack where he summons lightning strikes, and the other one is where he spawns several flying skulls. The former one is the one I have the least problems with. For the most part, it just makes you have to consider your movement more, and is mostly fine. When it starts to become problematic is when it's combo with the skulls. While he does have an attack that specifically spawns the skulls, he will also occasionally spawn them from some of his other attacks. When this is comboed with his lightning attack, the fight just kind of devolved into a bit of a shit show where I was just panic rolling instead of actually trying to time them with anything. This isn't really something that is rare, as it is a specific attack that he'll use pretty often. This being said, it's not as though everything about phase 3 is bad. Overall, it's a very visually striking phase, with a lot of effects that look great. He also does not have a cutscene between these two phases, as he will just play a short animation in the fight that indicate the change. This last one will sound a bit negative, but at the very least, his third phase isn't all that long. Most of the fight will be spent in phase 2, making it so the problems I have with the third phase aren't all that impactful in the overall fight. So, from a gameplay and presentation perspective, I think Gale is a pretty fantastic fight. Though I have to admit, I am a bit hesitant to talk about my biggest problem with Gale, as it doesn't really have anything to do with the fight itself. I also haven't really seen anyone else complain about this, but I still thought I would include it as, even with however biased of an opinion it is, it is still my list after all. My main problem with Gale is Gale himself. Gale is supposed to be the final fight we ever get in the Dark Souls series. He is the grand finale, but compared to Soul of Center, I just find him a bit lacking. I don't mean in terms of his fight. Evidently from his placement, I think Gale is a much better fight. It's just that in a storytelling sense, Gale just ends up feeling a lot less impactful doesn't really have any overarching meaning to the series. Obviously, it does end up leading you to the Pygmy Lords, which has a lot of lore significance, but Gale himself just doesn't mean much. 
He is a character that was introduced in Dark Souls 3, and even in this game you only end up meeting him a couple of times before you fight him. Emotionally, I just didn't care that I was fighting Gale. He could have been replaced with any number of people and my overall reaction would have been the same. Compare that to how I felt getting goosebumps when fighting the Soul of Sinter and there really isn't any comparison between the two. Though to be fair, a lot of people would probably just refute this by saying that Soul of Cinder is still the last boss and Gale wasn't meant to replace him. Which is fair if that is your stance on it, but as someone who is playing this as current content, Gale is the final fight that you end up fighting, so I was still left with the impression that I have now. Again, this doesn't really have any effect on the fight directly, but my emotional attachment to the bosses is a pretty big part for me. If you haven't noticed from the past entries, the way the fight makes me feel is probably the most important part, even more important than the actual mechanics in some cases. I can honestly excuse a bullshit move if it at least looks radical. I have tried to balance it out throughout the video to try and at least be somewhat objective with my ratings, but that became hard to uphold when it came to the last entries of the list, so this is how it ended up. Overall, I still think Gale is a fantastic fight, and if only it had the same sort of impact on me that the Soul of Cinder did, it would probably end up being my favourite boss fight in any game I've played. And it's a bit awkward that I decided to put cause right off the gale, especially when I went on that way too long rant on how important it was to me that gale was a bit of a no one. But the way I view cause is pretty much the complete opposite of gale. While I was disappointed that gale was a lackluster conclusion to the series from a storytelling perspective, I like that cause doesn't even try to be that lore significant. Obviously, he does have lore implications that is fairly important, but that is more that he exists at all and not anything to do with his character. My favorite part of this fight is that it's just that, a fight. And most importantly, a really fucking hard one. Cause is like the last hurdle for the player, a final fight where you have to put into use everything you have learned so far to be able to even stand that chance. Cause is a really hard boss that won't hold anything back while fighting you, allowing you to do the same. Instead of being burdened with having to work in some sort of character into the moveset, devs were free to just design a brutally difficult fight with no restrictions. The result was a fight that I would consider to be the hardest I have ever made, at least until the release of Elden Ring, and even then it's really hard to decide. I'm going to be honest, this is probably one of the fights where the game it is in is the most important. I've made it no secret that Bloodborne has my favourite combat out of any of the FromSoft games. Problem being, I didn't find any of the main game bosses to be all that challenging. There were a couple like Lagarius and Gascoigne that took me a few tries my first time around, but even with them, I cleared them much faster than most of the hard fights in Dark Souls 3 or Elden Ring. Though when the DLC came out, Bloodborne really felt complete, with my top 3 fights all being from it. Finally, I had some fights where I really felt challenged with both Ludwig and Lady Maria taking more tries than any of the fights in the main game. But where it really gets hard is with Koss. There isn't really anything specific to point to when explaining why Koss is so hard. He doesn't have any unique mechanics that are hard to deal with, nor does he have any specific attack that feels particularly hard to dodge. His moveset is just filled with moves that are generally hard to dodge from a combination of their speed and aggression. Even his aggression is something that I explained in the lore, you know, seeing how the dude was literally just born. So gameplay wise I honestly don't have that much to say about Koss. His moveset is great, everything feeling fair while still being extremely challenging in both his phase 1 and 2. Koss is also a good example of a 2 phase fight that does it well, with phase 1 easing into the second phase while still being challenging on its own. Phase 2 ends up feeling unique despite reusing several of the same moves as phase 1, making you still feel familiar with the fight with just enough moves to keep you on edge. One of the greatest strengths of Bloodborne is his presentation, and Cause is no exception. The fact that you're fighting what is essentially a newborn from some cosmic being is one of the most original and unique concepts for a fight I've seen in a game. This is perfectly carried on in the gameplay, with his lore being reflected in the animations and attacks. Design-wise, I'm also a huge fan, but here I'm more biased than normal in the fact that I'm a sucker for Lovecraftian stories and designs. He is for the most part pretty basic design-wise, but this is honestly fine when considering the type of fight it is. I don't really have that much more to say about Koss. Both down, the main reason I rate this fight so high is because it's by far the hardest fight in Bloodborne, while still managing to feel completely fair. While I think it's to its advantage that it's simple, if it did have stronger lore implications with a more complex design, it would have the potential to be my favourite fight of all time. Though I am perfectly happy with the end result of what they made, and Koss does still end up being my third favourite fight. I am Melania. 
blade of Mikola. And I have never known defeat. Choosing between the final fight was probably the hardest choice I had to make in this entire list. Melania ends up having a better presentation with more lore significance and a better flow in combat, but still has a few problematic attacks. Meanwhile, Fride ends up lacking when it comes to the presence in the series, but makes up for it with a fight that has three faces that all feel unique from one another, while still managing to make them all perfect. In the end, I ended up favoring the consistency of Fride's gameplay over Melania's presentation. But enough about Free Day, this is Melania's segment after all. Despite only being the first of two phases, I think phase 1 of Melania's fight manages to be the most enjoyable fight in the entire game. Phase 1 is another great example of what I like to call a duel fight. There isn't anything extra, there's a straight up one on one fight where both use whatever weapon they came equipped with. Though Melania does have her lifesteal mechanic, but I don't personally find this to affect the actual duel feeling of the fight. All of her attacks in the phase are fun attacks to play against, giving the fight a great flow overall. Well, this is except for one attack. The Waterfowl Dance is a pretty controversial attack, many thinking it's a complete bullshit attack that is impossible to dodge, and honestly, usually I think I would agree with this. But for some reason, I don't really mind this attack all that much. For the most part, I don't like it when I have to use one specific thing from outside the fight to be able to clear it. And of course, you don't technically need to do this with this fight either. There are ways to dodge the attack with some clever movement, but I think the conclusion most people come to is that it's unreasonable to expect the player to do this. Again, I would normally agree with this, but the main reason I don't in this instance is that there are several in-game ways of either just straight up cancelling it or dodging it. But even not counting this, I still kind of like this sort of mechanic. This is the first time in a very long time they've introduced a mechanic where you can't just solve it by rolling. You actually have to think and use clever movement in a way to bait her into certain directions. I completely understand why people might not like this sort of mechanic, but personally I hope that FromSoft continues to do this sort of thing. It's innovative in a way that digs a bit deeper than letting you just jump over a tanks. Moving on to the second phase. For the most part, despite phase 2 completely changing the way she fights, I find it to be pretty on par with phase 1 when it comes to general difficulty and enjoyment. It becomes less of a jewel type fight and becomes more of a standard FromSoft fight where you are fighting a stronger being than yourself. What ends up being the saving grace for this phase for me is this presentation. Phase 2 Melania is probably my favourite design that FromSoft has ever made. Visually, phase 2 Melania is breathtaking. I pretty much immediately made up my mind once I saw it that Melania was my favourite boss that they have made. She is fantastic in both visual design and storytelling. I only wish that she had slightly more lore around her. Hopefully they add a bit more in the DLC. Gameplay wise, I still really do like Phase 2. It's just a bit hard to praise it when I do still think it's a downgrade from Phase 1. It is more complex and has harder to dodge attacks, but it loses some of the flow I felt from the first phase. None of the attacks are problematic or bad, but it inherently just loses some of the flow as the attacks become more focused on her scarlet rot magic stuff rather than just her sword play alone. I do still like that they did this phase though, it adds a lot to her character being shown her scarlet rot form, and even if I like it less, it's still a fantastic phase. I feel as though I should have more to say about Melania, but honestly I don't. She's my favourite character in any FromSoft game, but I still really find it hard to express why other than she's just cool as hell. If you haven't looked into her lore, I would strongly recommend doing so. I won't be going through any of it here, as this video is already way too long, but it is definitely worth reading. Well, I don't have much more to say, so I guess it's about time we moved on to my number one pick. Tis only the flame quivering at misguided ash. Please avert thine eyes. I have a lot to say about Free Day, so I'm just going to go straight into phase 1. Sister Free Day's first phase is pretty perfect when put in the context of the rest of the fight. Much like Ishin, it's a slow phase meant to ease you into the fight. All of her attacks, and even the way she moves, is very slow and meticulous. When considering how long the fight is, this makes perfect sense. It's the type of phase that, after a few tries, you're just going to no-hit every time. Despite this, she does manage to be fairly unique, being one of the few bosses in the series that actually uses a stealth mechanic. I love this move for several reasons. Most obviously, it just looks really cool, both when she initially jumps away, but also when it connects. There aren't really all that many mechanics where you have to look at the dust the boss kicks up in order to determine her position. But most importantly, I love that it's a somewhat subtle callback to Priscilla. 
3D took something that I thought was an interesting but underutilized mechanic from the Priscilla fight and built on that to make a mechanic that both looks amazing and is actually fun to play against. Topping it off that they are both fights in a painted world and it's a pretty perfect highlight of the attention to detail that I love from FromSoft fights. So overall, I think phase 1 is pretty perfect as the first phase. It both eases you into the fight while also priming you for the rest of it. Aside from the gameplay, I'm still a pretty massive fan of everything else related to this fight. The intro cutscene is great and it's honestly pretty iconic. It had me quoting Father Ariandel for days afterwards. Both Father Ariandel and Sister Frida have memorable designs that are pretty distinct from the rest of the game, which does make sense when considering how the painted world is isolated from the rest of the world. The fact that it is isolated does end up being a bit of a double-edged sword though. It does a great job of making it feel unique, while also having some callbacks to the painted world in Dark Souls 1. Though this comes with a downside that it makes it very isolated from the rest of the game in a lore sense. On its own, the lore of the painted world is great. I love the lore of the world itself and how Ariandel fits into it. But when it comes to Frida specifically, I find it to be a bit weak. There is the fact that she is initially from Londo and has connections to some of the characters from there, but there isn't much more than this. She has the basis for something that could have ended up being very interesting, but instead you don't really get to learn that much about her from the DLC. This isn't really much of an aspect of the fight that I find bad, just disappointing and a missed opportunity. Moving on to the second phase, and the quality very much keeps up. The second phase is a duo fight against both Father Ariandel and Fride, and honestly, if you were to single this out as a single fight, it would probably be my second favorite duo fight in the entire series. It is basically what ONS could have been, a fight between a big and a small boss. While ONS had the problem of both the bosses being too aggressive, not really giving enough openings, this phase pretty much completely solves the problem by flipping the script and making Fride the passive one. Overall, Father Ariandel is pretty much the exact same as Mo, just much bigger and with a very different moveset, but he is still just some big dude that is pretty much constantly trying to run you down. But instead of having to also deal with the second enemy, Fride pretty much always keeps to the back and mostly uses ranged instead. This makes for a lot more of an enjoyable experience, where you can mainly focus on hitting Ariandel, but still having to keep a free day in mind. The way they achieve this is one of the most impressive design decisions in the entire game. Of course, you need to keep her in mind as she will attack you, but instead of making this attack an instant hit, it does frost damage over time, making it less punishing to get hit by, but if you get hit too much, you will get debuffed and chunked. This is much preferable than it being an instant hit that does a lot of damage and staggers you, like most other duo fights tend to use. The downside to making her attacks damage over time is that you don't really need to see her at all, just react to her attacks when they come. The way to solve this is by giving Frida a healing move. While in most other fights this might up being frustrating, in this fight it makes perfect sense. But giving her this mechanic, and by making it the only way you can tell that it's happening by directly looking at her, it forces you to always keep an eye on Frida in the entire phase. This combined with Fire Endel's moves all being very slow and easy to deal with, makes for a duo fight that is challenging, but fun and engaging the entire way through. This being said, I do have some problems with this phase, most coming from Father Ariandel. Like most other big bosses, Father Ariandel ends up having some hitbox problems. Most of the attacks consist of rushing attacks where he just kinda runs, or well I guess crawls at you. The problem comes when the attack starts, and when it ends. Much like Dragon Rush attacks, it's way too easy to get hit before you can really tell an attack has started, or get hit when they seem that the attack has ended but it still has a damaging hitbox around the boss. Other than this, I don't really have any problems with this phase. The end of this phase is pretty genius and one of the best fakeouts that FromSoft has done. The dialogue, plus giving you a slab, really gives you the sense that you've cleared the fight, and then the fear that you feel as Frida stands back up and activates yet another power is pretty unrivaled. Giving you the slab was especially clever as it doubles as both a fake out and is actually really convenient for players that might struggle with the next phase as it allows you to either fully upgrade your current weapon or swap to another weapon that is better suited for this specific fight. Despite phase 1 and 2 already being some of my favourite individual phases in the series, phase 3 is where it really pops off. This is where phase 1 really gets to show how good it actually is, but being a pretty good way of priming you for phase 3. They share a lot of attacks, though phase 3 obviously adds a lot more to it. In most fights, you'd expect the boss having 3 different elements would end up being too much, but Frida balances between them pretty perfectly. She never ends up spamming one too much and uses a good even spread. If anything, this spread ends up being a bit too perfect as I wouldn't mind her using a black flame moves a bit more as they aren't new. Despite having both frost and black flame attacks, Frida still manages to achieve a pretty great flow to her fight. 
A lot of bosses with elemental attacks end up feeling too segmented, like it's just a mix of single attacks that the boss throws at you. But with Friday's physical attacks, she manages to use a mix and achieves a pretty fantastic float that is fun to play against while never really feeling unfair. This being said, I do think she has one attack that I think might be a bit problematic. But in classic Souls fan fashion, I'm going to argue that it's actually really clever game design. The attack is question is the one where she jumps into the air and shoots a black flame wheel at you. Where a lot of people might find a problem with this attack is that you cannot dodge straight into it like you can with basically every other attack in the entire game. At first glance I agreed with this, but having thought about it, I think this is actually pretty clever. You see, the start animation of this attack can actually result in two different attacks. One being the black flame wheel and the second one being a frost attack. You can very easily tell what she's going to do by the effects around her, but the actual animation is the same. The reason I find this to be pretty significant is that while you can't roll through the black flame version, you can with the frost version, making so you actually have to see the effect on her and act accordingly. This is pretty rare in FromSoft fights, as you can for the most part just deal with every attack the same way, but here you actually have to think and act accordingly. I wish FromSoft would do more attacks like this, but as far as I can remember, they didn't end up doing this for Elden Ring, which is a shame. Other than this, I think your moveset is pretty perfect. The third phase alone is one of my favourite one-on-one -on -one fights in the entire series, with Millennia probably being the only one that actually manages to top it. And of course, the visuals for this phase are also perfect. Continuing with the feeling of isolation, Frida is one of the few enemies in the entire game that actually uses black flame attacks. All of her attacks, plus the aura she gets, are all stunning, making her look unique and easily being one of my favourite soul bosses design-wise. If I were to force myself to critique the fight, it would probably be that it's a bit too easy. I think this is a pretty poor complaint, as for most people this fight will be perfectly true, but as someone who has spent way too much time on these games, the fight just isn't hard enough. Don't get me wrong, the fight is really hard, but when compared to harder fights like Melania, Friday just doesn't manage to stack out. Like for example, when I fought her when I was replaying all the games for this video, I ended up swapping weapons twice to make the fight harder. First I start from a plus 10 refined exiled greatsword to a plus 5 wolf knight greatsword. This still ended up being a bit too much damage, so I swapped to a plus 6 refined Murakumo, which still did a bit too much damage, but it was the least damaging weapon I had, and I didn't want to go and get something else, so I ended up using it. Obviously none of this is really fair to Frida, as I have fought her before, and also played more FromSoft stuff since fighting her. The first time I fought her, she was really challenging, and was probably the most challenging fight they had made up until that point. I do remember absolutely loving the fight after having fought it the first time, something that did end up affecting its placement on my list. Like I said before, my personal belief is that the first time you fight a boss is the most important, and therefore I give it more weight than any other time I fight a boss. Overall, the most impressive part of Free Day is how she manages to be a fight with three faces, where every face on its own is a top tier fight. She's one of the longest fights they have made, and is still the most consistent fight they have ever made. I still find it hilarious how at the time of release, Phase 2 was my favourite duo fight they have ever made despite it being a single phase in a 3 phase fight. I remember being overall disappointed with the DLC as I was going through it, but after having beaten the fight, I thought it was honestly worth buying the DLC for this fight alone. I'm not really going to do an outro for this video, so I'm just going to throw up the full trailer so you can see it. But yeah, bye.